Helena Nade is Professor Emeritus at the Federal University of Sao Paulo. She, she obtained her PhD in, in Unif at UNIFESP and uh, followed this with postdoctoral training as a Fogarty Fellow at the University of Southern California. Since 1985, she's been a research fellow of the National Research Council for the Scientific and Technological Development. Her research field is molecular and cell biology of glycoconjugates. She's president of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, and she is honorary president of the Brazilian Society for the Advancement of Sciences. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker. Thank you so much. I will. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to be here because it's easier so that we can better check the slides. I'm honored to be here today. I want to thank all the organizers and especially my dear friend. Uh, oh boy, I'm emo I was really, I got emotional with the speech by Maria Luisa. And I don't think I have something to say after that because I was supposed to give you a message regarding the future of for disease for health in Latin America and the Caribbean. So uh, the title is Setting the Scene, Science and Public Health. Okay. Challenge in Latin America. I'm going to briefly go over some of aspects that we have faced in the last three, four years, and I'm going to bring some thoughts on other, because Latin America and the Caribbean, we have other challenges on top of neglected disease. And that's something also that we need to be aware. So besides all the problems also in financing education, science and technology, and in some countries, uh, also the health public system. So what I'm going to discuss with you very briefly, what is going on in the world and the the damage that we humans have done to that. So the world is changing land use and cover, alteration in biogeochemical flows. The so-called natural disasters, how come a disaster is natural? The, the name is wrong, just like neglected. Neglected as you, uh, it's very clear. Neglected by whom? We should always ask. And water shortage. Here in Brazil, everybody's looking at what's going on in the Amazon region. The rivers are dry, fishes are dying, and people are not getting anything to eat because they live on fishes. Chance in eating habits. That's true. We are becoming, the societies are becoming uh, fat metabolic diseases increasing worldwide. Climate change, loss of biodiversity, global pollution, urbanization. We are not uh, living anymore in the fields. We are living in cities and the cities are not planted. They don't have the right sewing system, they don't have water. So all this complicates health. And these changes are affecting health and living in society. So infectious disease, non-communicable disease also, they are increasing with some populations, not all, but depending on the average income, you may tend to live longer lives and then you're going to have other disease, nutrition, mental health, civil conflict and immigration. I was just talking to Professor Calisto. We must be aware of what's going to happen now in the conflict in Palestine and uh, Israel, 
because that population is going to increase in infectious disease, for sure, besides others. Employability and jobs, that's an aspect that's going to change and is going to affect health. Education, if we don't give the proper education, we won't clarify even for our neglected disease. Sustainable development and achieving the 17 SDGs by 2030. That's impossible. The uh, world, uh, they are clarifying that, unfortunately. Nobody's discussing that. And that's something that was accepted by global population. What are we doing in that respect? Zero. And here is something that you, I, I don't dare to speak to you people because I work with glycochemistry, glycobiology. One of the compounds that I study a lot is heparin. Has, uh, has nothing directly to do with the discussions in here. So I don't dare to speak to you, but here it is 1918, Spanish flu, influenza, 57 H2N2, Asian flu, 68 A3N2, Hong Kong flu, 1976, and this has been coming over a few times. Uh, don't worry, I won't fall. <laughs> About, you, you're, uh, you, go, you got us all uh, health ins uh, insurance. <laughs> That's why. Very bright. Now I can understand why. Uh, virus, 1981, as Maria Luisa already told us, HIV, 2003, SARS-CoV-1. At that time, didn't get the one because we expect we didn't know we were going to get the two, MERS, Zika virus, and SARS-CoV-2. And what got on me, even though I'm not from this field, is the fact that most governments were aware that these were coming. There were several indications, but again, money talked louder, louder, unfortunately, because in order to prevent, we should have done several things that we didn't. And here, now everybody's talking about One Health approach, because it became a mimic. And I don't like when things get too popular because people use the word, use the approach without really not being involved with the topic. What does this mean? This means that we need to change our way of living. And who is really willing to do that? Who is really going to pay to have a balance with the environment? And here is uh, 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 B the British Medical Journal opinion talking about this 2020, one health approach to improve human pandemic in fashion control. Planetary health. Fantastic, that's what we want. Are we doing that? Here in Brazil, no. And I can guarantee in several countries, I cannot talk about all of them, but uh, I, we have a, 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 a network of academies of science that go from Canada to Argentina. And uh, we had a meeting about uh, with the uh, eight Amazon countries because the biggest part, chunk of the Amazon is in Brazil. But there are eight different countries and the territory. Don't forget that France owns 
a part of, which is called Guiana, French Guiana. So we had a meeting, and in this meeting, in the, during the summit that Lula did in Belém, we had a meeting previous to that in Manaus. And the, the discussions showed that at least for the Amazon region, the problems are exactly the same. No modifications, no change. So I would say that planetary health is not going on too well in Latin. I don't know, I'm not going to speak about North America, but I don't think they are doing well too. Not even UK, because North America is drilling in the Alaska. And UK is drilling in the North Sea. So I don't think people, indeed, governments, are concerned with planetary health. Because fossil fuel is going to remain for a long time, unfortunately. Here is the Lancet, Lancet planetary health several years ago, and he's talking. I, I, I like to point it out part of this editorial that's but rapid human driven change in the environment is trapping human security for reasons far beyond environmental degradation. So it's not only the degradation and pay attention. Climate change leads to instability leads to displacement and migration, worsens existing conflicts, and threatens global security. A new reality is emerging. Planetary health is an excellent opportunity to find alternative solutions for a better and more resilient future. We are seeing this going on in Brazil, we are seeing this going on in Latin America, people moving towards conflicts, people shutting down frontiers because they don't want people to come in. So we have a global challenge which really goes beyond uh, the health problems. This you know much better, so the current paradigm paradigm, disease surveillance, investigation, treatment, the One Health, environmental surveillance, prediction, and prevention. That's what we would like to have. This is uh, uh, another uh, editorial, and this is interesting because it's from the World Bank. So, and this was 2017. So before, before the pandemics. And I want to point it out. Multiple pandemics, numbers all, all since the turn of the century is barely 17 years because 2017 and the world is not being prepared. The world will see another pandemic editorial 2017 the costs of inaction are immense we proved that and who suffered latin america and the caribbean and african countries for sure the lack of vaccines it's not that people the individuals are friend Countries didn't act friend, friendly. We need to be aware of that. Neglect tropical disease. Maria Luisa told us already, and this is a late a paper from Fiocruz. I want just to uh, emphasize this: that among uh, more than a thousand uh, drugs, only 15,000, uh, uh, 1,500 new drugs from 
75 to 204, only 21, 1.3% were dedicated to neglected disease. That's the big pharma. Nothing against them, let's clear up. But this is why this meeting is so important, so relevant. Another thing that we are all over the globe having is problems due to the pandemics, due to the isolation, and also something that we never really paid too much attention, mental health. Mental health here in Brazil gets a very small percentage of the total budget of the Ministry of Health, a very, very small percentage. I don't know why we have a difficult in saying that there is a disease caused by an imbalance in, uh, in the brain, in the mental. We can say, we realize and we accept disease such as uh, diabetes and so on, but we don't like the word mental health. This is also something that we need to be concerned, due use of research of concern. Things that are good for, are for good, but can, can be used for bad. How do we control this? Do we have this picture in Latin America and the Caribbean region? I don't think so. The future of health, so many different therapies, this is going to break down, at least in Brazil, the, health, the public health system. They cannot, we are not having the immunotherapy that most of the patients will need. We need to discuss that. Other relevant non-communicable disease, another one that's important in here, in this discussion, fungal infections. We saw candidiasis, some type of candida that was killing in the, in the hospitals, I think was in, in a hospital in Bahia that started and go over. Antimicrobial resistance and infection control air pollution, food security, water security, contaminating due to mining. Latin American and the Caribbean, in the Amazon countries, exactly the same problem that we have in Brazil with mercury. They have exactly the same problems. Mercury is banished in the world. It's, it's not a, a, a true statement because people can have mercury illegally, someone is selling, and used to mine gold, and someone is buying that gold. So it's a chain of power, it's a chain of uh, money. Here it's a, a, a publication from Ayanas showing in Latin America all the health, climate health changes that are important for the country. I can give you later the information. And here, oil and gas, this is the health industrial complex. I'm not going to talk about that. I want to point it out to this. Pharma, you see here, is percentage of industry net margin. We have to say this. Oil is in here. Two times higher net is for pharma. So we need to start to demand. We are society. Unfortunately, I have to say these things. I apologize. Probably it's not what you want me to say. But I have to say, I'm as president of the Brazilian Academy of Science, as co-chair of IANAS, that takes all Americas, I have to state this. 
We are not being paid to say by any government, we don't take money from, uh, we don't accept those things just so that we can be free to demand when it's necessary. That's another problem. Here's for Brazil. I don't know the other countries in Latin America, but the demographics of the population, we are going to get older and increase in age-related disease. And I want to thank, I think I got to the 20 minutes, I want to thank the NDI and I want to congratulate the NDI for the fantastic work that you are doing. I want to really salute Lola for this, his 10th anniversary, or her. Lola is a woman, so her 10th <laughs> anniversary. Unicup for he, having us here, FAPESP, Academia Brasileira de Ciências, and my alma mater, Escola Paulista de Medicina, Calisto, did his graduate work over there, and now today we have the university. Thank you so much. Moving on to our next speaker to tell us about drug discovery and really to introduce the DNDI Lola Consortium. If you don't know Lola, or perhaps you don't know Jadel, it seems unlikely, let me introduce Jadel. Um, he's the head of discovery and partnerships for Latin America at DNDI, based in Brazil. Uh, he's a pharmacist with, P with a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from the Federal University of Santa Catarina. He's got experience in drug discovery projects for neglected tropical diseases and is interested broadly in the development of collaborative networks to enable drug discovery in both industrial and academic settings. So, over to Jadel. Uh, good morning. Uh, hello everyone, thanks Charlie for, for the introduction. It's truly a pleasure here to be here today to see everyone, to see the, this event happening. Uh, I would like to first thank Luis, thank Unicamp, uh, FAPESP, uh, all my DNDI colleagues, all the organizers and everyone around here for, to, to help us set up this event. And it's truly a great opportunity to talk about drug discovery and the NDI Lola Consortium, two topics which are very close to my heart. So it's a great opportunity. And I hope, uh, and I'm sure actually, that during today and tomorrow and during this event, we will see global, local, concrete examples on how to build sustainable uh, and, and innovative uh, health ecosystems. We plan to highlight the importance of drug discovery and really hope to inspire everyone to keep co uh, continue building this early stage drug discovery capacity in Latin America, really looking at transforming the knowledge into innovation that brings positive impact into the, the society. This session specifically is focused on, on the Lola project, which is great for me because I know it very well. And it's an example of how the NDI, using its alternative model of innovation and together with our partners here in Brazil, we plan to do like this innovative science here and also to, to develop the treatments the patients need for, to treat the diseases that are endemic here in the region. So I don't have to tell you uh, a lot about this. We are all involved into the pharmaceutical innovation systems, but drug discovery, really key drug discovery projects around the globe, they are conducted nowadays by small biotechs or big pharmaceutical companies, building on the, on the knowledge that is usually generated at the academic setting and counting with the support from contract research organizations. So this open innovation model, very different from the old pharmaceutical innovation model, uh, has brought many drugs and a massive uh, improving the quality of life uh, of the population around the globe. But of course, uh, as you all know, uh, modern drug discovery is not an easy task. It's a very difficult process. Uh, not a single organization can do it alone anymore because it it's a long, costly, very risky project that relies 
on several uh, expertise, going from technical to scientific uh, management skills. So it's, it's quite, a, quite an endeavor, uh, really. And unfortunately, the, this process does not happen equally around the world. It's not that uh, every institution, every country has all the capacities to run successful drug discovery projects. In fact, many of the countries and the groups in Latin America, including Brazil, do not have all the capacity, all the framework, the technical framework and the collaborative mindset that is actually required to, to conduct successful drug discovery projects. And that's an issue, of course, I think that's part of the reason we are all here today. Uh, because we need to, to find ways to, to really uh, address the, the need to, 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 to generate the innovation that the, the society needs. And by not doing this innovation this, that translates the knowledge into new, new treatments, we prevent our populations from accessing the, the treatments and the countries stay dependable of these global supply chains. This was very, very clear, I think, during and after the pandemics. And it's an issue, of course. Uh, and when we talk about radical innovation, developing new treatments, we are talking necessarily about the drug discovery stage, which is the first steps of, of the R&D development for, for new treatments. We talk about the, the, the process of identifying compounds that are active, the so-called HITs, and they are advanced to the HIT to lead and lead optimization process, that process that comprises this iterative cycles of synthesizing new compounds with slight modifications over it, uh, designing them and synthesizing them in the lab and then getting it tested in multiple assays to generate data that is used to compare with, uh, let's say, a list of uh, desirable criteria, which is the target candidate profile, which reflects what a product would look like uh, when treating patients. And if we get these uh, compounds, uh, this balance of physical, chemical, biological properties that are acceptable and aligned with this target candidate profile, then the candidates will go on to the preclinical, clinical development phases and eventually will become a drug. So that's, that's what we talk when we talk about drug discovery, right? But unfortunately in Latin America it's not different the scenario. When we talk about specifically drug discovery projects, there are a few islands of excellence, I think, a few great examples, but the general scene is not really good, really. Drug discovery is still incipient. It's very much an academic effort. Uh, there's not a lot of sharing of information, collaboration, unfortunately. Uh, also, the engagement between academia and industry is still very rare. So most of the, the, the pharmaceutical companies that are based in the region still rely a lot on the generics. So this, of course, results in most of the drug discovery projects staying in the very early steps. So we don't progress towards the, the development of a treatment, and that, of course, results in lack of innovation. So it's an issue we need to, to, to think about on how to address that, and I'm sure we are going to see examples on how to do that during these two years and inspire us to, to keep going in the right direction. That's one issue around uh, the innovation in the pharmaceutical sciences. The other one is that it's, it doesn't happen in every therapeutic area equally. So we've seen that there are major breakthroughs, very innovative treatments, uh, uh, cellular therapy, CART cells, uh, immunotherapy, of course, but it doesn't happen for every disease, for every disease. There are some diseases, particularly uh, affecting billions of people from poor communities that do not receive the, the, the investment that is required, and, and as a result, we have very few products developed for these neglected populations over the years. Over the last decades, less than 1%, Professor Elena just, just talked about this. So this is an issue, and I think combined with the lack of innovation in endemic areas, we have a, we have a problem that keeps perpetuating this lack of innovation and lack of prioritization of the, the, the development treatment for, for some of these diseases. So there are room, and, or maybe even need, for alternative model of innovation. We need to combine them, the different models of innovation that we have uh, currently available in the world. And the NDI was created in this context in 2003, 20 years ago. The NDI was created as a virtual, non-for-profit research organization that works these highly collaborative models around the globe, bringing different partners together to develop treatments that are, from the very conceptualization to all the end to the implementation phase, taught for the needs of these patients with efficacy, safety, and affordability as part of its characteristics. So that's very important. And we, using this model, try to solve a little bit the unmet needs that are generated from, let's say, the traditional model uh, of innovation. The NDI has 
been working with partners to develop new treatments for some of the diseases that are here in this slide. You can look, many of these are very endemic here in Latin America, as you know, Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, Dengue, for instance. These are huge public health uh, concerns for us, and we need to, to, to develop treatments for, for these patients. Over the 20 years of uh, the NDI history, uh, we have uh, developed 12 treatments using this, this system together with many partners around the globe. Some of them are actually developed here in Brazil, which is great. Uh, they, they are all bringing benefits for the patients. They are easy to use. They are affordable, adapted to the rural areas. There are new combinations or short treatments or maybe formulations for, for pediatric indications. And a few of them you will see there if you look closely and you have the time. Uh, they are new chemical entities, so treatments that were developed from the very early stage. So it's, it's good that the NDI is starting to show that this model can also bring what we call here in Brazil the radical innovation, right? The, the new chemical entities. Uh, but for some of these diseases, there are still major unmet needs. Chagas disease, for instance, is one of them. So we need to keep working and to conduct these, uh, the, the develop new, new treatments from scratch, really from, from the bench, you need these highly collaborative models. The NDI has been screening compounds, millions of compounds to identify antiparasitic, antiviral compounds. And then when we identify these hits, we partner with uh, research institutions around the globe on this lead optimization consortia, together many times with pharmaceutical companies. So building to, uh, bringing together all the capacities, the expertise that, that is needed, being close to the patients to develop these new chemical entities. Throughout the portfolio, we have more than 20 of them. Some of them, you listen to the stories throughout this day. Some of our partners are here. We will tell the nice or not so nice stories maybe about some of these chemicals because it's, the attrition rate in drug discovery is massive. It's a difficult, it's a difficult task. Uh, from the discovery team at the NDI, we have a very bold uh, ambition, I think, to, the, to deliver until 2028 eight to 10 new chemical entities. To, as a treatment, so it's a, it's a very tough uh, mission that we set for ourselves. Uh, and we plan to do that, of course, using this traditional highly collaborative um, uh, format, phenotypic-based type of drug discovery, but also to leverage new technologies, uh, leverage new treatment modalities, such as not only antiparasitic, antiviral, but also host-directed therapies, immunomodulation, uh, monoclonal antivirus, and so on and so forth. But one part of the strategy we have in drug discovery that I want to bring your attention to is that it's part of the NDI mission and the model to also come closer to the partners in the endemic areas. We have this mission embedded in our actions. So it's part, you can see here, it's part of our, our mission in drug discovery to build the capacity and work closely with the partners from end-to-end R&D in the endemic areas. And of course, the LOLA, the Lead Optimization Latin America, is one example of that. It was a project that started back in 2013, so 10 years ago. We're here to celebrate the 10 years. Uh, as a very niche, very small project, seeding and checking if the idea of combining the NDI's expertise in drug discovery with the capacity of the good science that we had here in Brazil will make sense towards two major goals. So develop preclinical candidates, of course, that's what we do in the discovery, focusing in Chagas disease and Leishmaniasis, but also to build this capacity, to build the coordination, the, the mindset of a collaborative project for, for drug discovery, and bring in the, the expertise that we didn't have in the region, particularly, for instance, pharmacokinetics in vitro and others. So this was, this was the original idea back then. It started very small and it grew, uh, and we are very proud of that. Uh, over the 10 years now, the NDI, together with the partners here at Unicamp and University of Sao Paulo mainly, we developed this phenotypic-based drug discovery unit, which is able to, to aggregate like capacities such as synthetic chemistry, medicinal chemistry, in vitro models for parasitology, in vivo models as well, bringing in together the, the mindset and the integration of pharmacokinetics from very early stage, which is quite important, and more, most of all, like the coordination, the organization of a core unit to conduct these activities here in the region. We work locally, we, we really try to, to approach with many institutions, research groups here in Brazil and Latin America, but we also connect globally. So we, we connect this project with the NDI's network and we want to make the Brazilian good science go abroad, but also bring the best of the science from abroad to Brazil to make it, make it happen, it's very important. And of course, with, without mentioning that this requires 
money and resources, of course, so we had uh, the support from many donors over, over this path. Minister of Health back in 2013, the Brazilian National Development Bank later on, and currently we count with the support from FAPAS from, through the PT scheme, and also the EMBRAPI system through the Minister of Science and Technology, which is great and a lot of in-kind support from the universities, groups will share the mission and share the goal and, and really dedicate time, resources to, to, to make it, to help us make this, this small project go forward and reach its objectives. This is the, the structure we have today. So we have the NDI coordinating, we have capacity for synthesis and design at Unicamp here under the supervision of Professor Luis Carlos Diaz and more recently at Northeastern under the university in the U.S. Uh, with uh, Dr. Laurie Ferenc. We get all our compounds tested in standardized model, well-validated models at the University of Sao Paulo under the coordination of Professor Carolina Borsoi and uh, in vitro admin data generated at the University of Sao Paulo in San Carlos under the coordination of Professor Andri Adriano Andricopoulou. And if we get lucky, if we get good compounds, they will be progressing to the more complex models, secondary assays, in vivo assays running PK, integrating that information, PK and efficacy, which is very important to, to raise the chances of these compounds progressing to, to the next stages of the direct discovery development. It's been a journey, of course, like 10 years. We, we did quite a lot. Uh, we worked with several series, different chemical scaffolds, uh, progressing them towards decision making. We stopped many of these projects. It's part of direct discovery, as you know. It's important to fail fast, learn from it, and, and get the knowledge uh, back into the system to, to back translate and, and, and improve. We have a couple of series ongoing now. We hope to, to, to keep progressing and get closer to a candidate for Chagas disease. But the team is also very proud to have implemented this in vitro ADME platform, combining highly modern uh, bioluminescent parasite models for in vivo testing in, in animals, which is, which is quite a nice uh, platform that is connected now to drug discovery for neglected tropical diseases. Here in Brazil, open to the community, we are more than happy to share the resources and learning with other groups. Uh, it has also been the training ground for multiple scientists. We need that as well. It's great. Uh, publications, other, other projects were also as a positive spin-offs uh, of this project. We have other exploratory collaborations. We're studying new stuff. Uh, Luis is going to tell you about one of these initiatives. Yesterday we were discussing projects in the natural products field as well. So we are excited. There's still a lot to do because it's great, we've done a lot, but we still haven't nominated a preclinical candidate that went into the clinical development. It has been very difficult for everyone working particularly on the Chagas field, as you know. But we keep, we keep moving forward and working together. We hope that uh, this small example, this small project that we share, cherish a lot, will inspire you we, to build this virtual network of multiple partners of conducting collaboratory drug discovery in Latin America to replicate this model and, and go out together as a community trying to shift this paradigm. We need to stop thinking about just pure publication type of science and really develop the capabilities and look to develop the treatments for the patients. So this is it for me for today. Again, thank you everyone for being here. I would like to congratulate all the, the team members, the, the ones that are here today and all the ones that already passed by, all the support from the NDI, the donors, and all of you for being here today. Thank you. The first of them you've met, you know him quite well already, but uh, for me, having spent more than 10 years now working with Luis Carlos, it's a pleasure to introduce him and I have to take the opportunity to do that. But um, Luis has a degree in chemistry, a PhD uh, in chemical sciences from Unicamp, and he's been a full professor in the Institute of Chemistry since 1992, and he's a researcher 1A in CMPQ. In 2013, Luis took uh, a big step and his research group started collaborations with Medicines for Malaria Venture, MMV, and with Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI, and with the goal of developing new drugs for the treatments of Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, and malaria, and to build a world-class academic drug discovery center for tropical diseases in Latin America. So over to Luis to hear a bit more about that.
Let me just remove this because it's a little bit dangerous. Actually, we do not have any health insurance for the participants, so you better be careful here, guys. Okay, so I'm going to use my time here to explain how uh, this uh, Lola consortium is started. Uh, and Lola, in fact, is, 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 is a very common name in Latin countries. We have a lot of movies, a lot of films with, uh, with Lola in the title. I think the most famous one is Lola, Run, Lola, or Run, Lola, Run, something like that. This is a very nice movie. But um, thank you very much, Charlie. I really appreciate that. So I'm going to use my time here to explain how this started. I've been a professor at Unicamp for almost 32 years. And I have built, in fact, a very solid career in the field of uh, synthetic organic chemistry, methodology, and total synthesis of bioactive natural products, complex bioactive natural products, and even theoretical chemistry. But the focus of my work was always, I mean, being academic in nature, with absolutely no experience in medicinal chemistry or drug discovery. I was in a comfort zone. But I was already concerned about making contributions to this field, to the field of neglected diseases, and conducting work of, of um, greater social uh, relevance. With this objective in mind, in 2007, so I have a few notes here because my mind and my memory is not the same, but I think it was in 2007, together with my colleague, Professor Adriano Andricopolo from USP São Carlos, we applied for a World Health Organization grant. I mean, and we were selected among, I don't know, maybe 500 or 600. This was a project with TDR, the Special Program for Research and Training uh, in Tropical Diseases, a special program of the World Health Organization. And the objective back in 2008 was to conduct the optimization, the first optimization steps of, of a chemical series against Chagas disease. And we worked with the WHO from 2008 until 2011. And in fact, everything changed when Sir Simon Campbell uh, invited me to collaborate with DNDI and MMV. I was, uh, uh, back in 2012, I was in Cambridge, spending some time there in UK. On July 6, 2012, at 1 p.m., Charlie, you were there, we had the first face-to-face -face meeting with MMV and DNDI at the lounge bar of the Crown Plaza Hotel, which is a hotel in the city center in Cambridge. So this meeting was organized by Simon, uh, who would have a dinner at the Christie's College in Cambridge on the same night, actually. So at this meeting, I met for the first time Jeremy Burroughs from MMV, um, Jeremy Burroughs from MMV, Robert or Hop Don from DNDI, Charlie Mowbray from, from DNDI, and a few days later at the same hotel I met Paul Willis from MMV. According to Simon, the idea was to meet the discovery directors of MMV and DNDI and discuss about medicinal chemistry options in this country. So when I had the chance to learn about these outstanding institutions, I have to tell you that I really got in love. Marcella, I got in love with MMV and with DNDI. So I saw the possibility of fulfilling my expectations as a scientist by collaborating to develop strategies to address you know, the, the health needs of vulnerable populations in the developing world. These two fantastic organizations, MMV and DNDI, have a fabulous history of developing new treatments and new drugs for various tropical parasitic diseases and have saved millions of lives. We just showed you here that in these 20 years, because DNDI is celebrating 20 years since its inception foundation in 2003, DNDI developed 12 treatments for six deadly diseases. They are saving millions of, li millions of lives. So after lots of remote meetings and discussions, the collaborations with MMV and DNDI started officially in March 2013. The project with MMV was named Brazil Long Duration Heterocycles and with DNDI was named LOLA, Lead Optimization Latin America. In fact, 
At that time, we made all of the arrangements to start the Lola project with the same series we were working with TDR. So that was our first DNDI series. It's important to mention that Dr. Marco Desoy, who is here at the audience, started at a postdoc in 2008 in this project with TDR. And he's still in my lab, working in collaboration with DNDI. So in 2013, I also joined the CIBFAR program, uh, CEPIT CIBFAR program, a large FAPES project coordinated by my colleague Glaucio's Oliva, who is here in the audience. In 2015, I submitted a grant proposal for FAPES, a PIT grant. This grant was approved, but after a long time discussing the contract, only five years after the, after the initial submission in 2020, we were able to start the Molecules Initiative for Me Neglected Disease Consortium, the MIND Consortium to try to discover novel drug candidates for clinical development for malaria with MMV and for Chagas diseases with DNDI. This was the result of an agreement between MMV, DNDI, FAPESP, USP, and, and UNICA. This project, I can tell you, is the first partnership involving MMV and DNDI in the academia in Latin America that focus on lead optimization a very com complex, a very crucial step in the process of drug discovery. The aim is to develop oral drugs, highly effective, with no toxicity issues and low cost. With MMV as an extra challenge, we are working to develop a one-dose treatment for malaria. So let's talk a little bit more about the Lola, which was created 10 years ago. The consortium main partners are the University of Campinas, the University of Sao Paulo, now we have Northeastern, University in Boston, and is coordinated by DNDI. This collaborative project aims to develop new and effective drugs for the treatment of Chagas disease, Leishmaniasis, and other diseases. So uh, this project also aims to bring to Brazil a new expertise in the field of drug discovery, highlighting the importance of collaborative work in this challenging area of research. We don't have to I mean, experience in drug discovery in this country, as was mentioned before. So in this work, DNDI, together, many partners from academia and major world pharmaceutical companies, research institutes, universities in Brazil and abroad are, are adding their efforts in favor of a single goal, save the lives of the most neglected people on this planet. In the workflow we first developed years ago, everything started here at Unicamp in my laboratory with the synthesis, with the preparation of the, of the heat compounds. We keep doing this, but in 2022, the research group of Professor Laurie Ferris from Northeastern University in Boston joined the Lola Consortium. So we are sharing experience with uh, uh, another group uh, in the area of medicinal chemistry. At the beginning, most of the synthesized compounds were sent abroad to have their biological and pharmacokinetics and toxicity properties evaluated. But as Jadel mentioned, it, we were able to build capacity in this area in Brazil. After promoting training for a team of scientists, today Lola has a robust team of collaborators who are experts in this field, especially in the research groups of Professor Adriano Andricopoulos and Professor Carolina Moraes from USP São Carlos and from USP São Paulo. C Professor Carolina joined the consortium a few years uh, ago. So this collaborative work has already impacted uh, very positively in the development of new capacities in Brazil by helping to establish modern technologies and broaden our vision for this complex and challenging pipeline of drug development. But, but this has been just the beginning of our journey. Now it's the time to go a step further. And I believe within the next uh, few years with this consolidated consortium, we have the appropriate tools to do our best to achieve our goals and make the difference. We believe this partnership can certainly pave the way for future collaborations, promote interactions among scientists with different expertise in this area from Brazil and from abroad, trigger the nucleation of human resources in Brazil in the field of drug discovery and certainly open doors for innovative ideas and technological innovation in Brazil. DNDI believes that supporting more active actions by universities in endemic countries and the insertion in international research and development network is absolutely fundamental to achieve the objective of developing new treatments for unmet diseases 
that are designed for, from their conception to meet the needs of neglected patients. But we face a lot of challenges. This is not an easy task. It's very tough to work in this area of drug discovery. I can tell you that after 10 years of experience. In Brazil, in fact, in Latin America, there is a large gap in coordination and technical capabilities necessary to conduct translational research, connecting basic research to applied research. The, press, the process of developing a new drug is very complex, depends on uh, different expertises. It can't be conducted by just one isolated institution and is especially difficult in the case of infectious disease, in the case of uh, 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 neglected disease. It's essential to improve uh, investments in research, to focus on training human resources and to improve the pharmaceutical innovation ecosystem. The work we are doing here is a concrete example of science returning to society. The best science for those who need it most, as the NDIO always says, the best science for the most neglected, to solve human challenges. In the darkest time that Brazilian science faced in the last few years, I am sure that this partnership is a fantastic example of what we can do and an answer for those who insist on denigrating the public universities, the science, the scientists, the researchers, and our research funding institutions. Since 2015, I am no longer working in the field of total sense of bioactive products, so I left my comfort zone to accept this challenge together with MMV and to, D to DNDI. And I am trying to learn parasitology. I'm not that young anymore, so this is quite difficult. So not only trying to learn parasitology, but uh, I mean everything related to medicinal chemistry and the concepts you know, related to drug discovery. But having the real chance to minimize the suffering of victims of parasitic tropical diseases such as Chagas disease, not only makes worthwhile this big shift in my career, but it has brought a new purpose to my life. I know we still have a lot to do, a lot to learn, but despite the progress we have made, we still have a long way ahead of us. DNDI launched a few years ago the Loki Consortium in India, along the lines of Lola. So now we have Lola and Loki. Lucky with C, not with K, but uh, 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 we have these two consortiums now, and I can say that it's ki kind of a seed from, from Lula. We wish luck and success to Lucky, coordinated by Dr. Musumi Mondal, present here in the audience. This is a moot hand task force, and I have many names to thank. Of course, Sir Simon Campbell helped us brilliantly by acting as a consultant from 2013 to 2021. In particular, I would like to thank Rob Don, Charlie, Mowbray, Peter, Jean Robert, Sergio, Jadel, Luisa, Cruz, who works at DNDI, but she was a postdoc for three years in my laboratory. Thanks to the entire teams of DNDI. There are men, I mean, there are a lot of people. We have a lot of people from DNDI here. So, uh, and especially those who helped me to build this consortium at the beginning, beginning. Thanks to my colleagues from USP, Glaucius, Adriano. Thanks to Calisto. Thanks uh, to all of our students, to all of the postdocs that worked in my lab uh, during these years. Thanks to Unicamp and USP for the facilities and thanks to all the staff and the employees who support us to do this work. And, and of course, finally, thanks for, to FAPESP for the CP, the CBFAR, and the PT grants. I mean, it's not that easy to talk about these two needs. Sorry. This is all about saving lives, guys. So thank you very much for listening. And thanks, and thanks to Dean and I for making this possible. Thank you.
and also, and also from the University of Michigan. He was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan until 2002. And currently he's a full professor of medicinal chemistry at the University of Sao Paulo and has experienced in medicinal chemistry, drug discovery, and especially areas of neglected tropical diseases, cancer, and biodiversity. He's a full member of the Brazilian Academy of Sciences, president of the Sao Paulo Academy of State Sciences, and a research fellow of the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development, CMPQ, a level 1A. Uh, he's also a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and many other organizations and extensively published. So it's a real pleasure to welcome Adriano to come and give his perspective about the Loader Consortium. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Chan, for the introduction, uh, the NDI for the invitation to be here today, Luis for hosting this very nice uh, event. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today and see many friends and colleagues here in the audience. Ten years ago, the NDIs launched its first innovative neglected disease early stage research program in Latin America, in Brazil, in the state of Sao Paulo, embracing the partnership of Unicamp and USP São Carlos. Several lead chemical series progressed through the stages of heat identification and confirmation, heat to lead, and lead optimization to develop promising compounds for leishmaniasis and Chagas disease. We have had success, and also we have learned from our failures in these years. Good results in this field take time, effort, patience, dedication, consistent hard work, and above all, multidisciplinary collaboration between scientists to navigate the complex world of drug discovery and development for neglected tropical disease. Uh, today, I want to thank many people who have contributed to this project in my lab in São Carlos. Postdocs, colleagues, technicians, especially uh, here, uh, present today, Leonardo and Rafael, uh, because without these people, we'd not be able to do any of this. I want to thank my colleague, Luis Carlos Diaz, and all his research team at Unicamp for their fantastic collaboration, dedication, and exceptional work. I see here Marco, Maria, Ramon, Luisa, Rafael. I want also to thank FAPESP and CNPQ for financial support, and the University of São Paulo and the São Carlos Institute of Physics for the institutional support and high quality research environment. I want to thank Jadel for your important contribution since you joined the NDI in 2016, am I right? Yeah? Your commitment has been of great benefit to the team. I appreciate the work you did in guiding us towards our goals and empower us to overcome difficulties and challenges. I want also to thank Charlie and my colleague, Glaucius Oliva, for their scientific guidance generosity, and willingness to help. After a decade, I can say doubt about it, that DNDI, with this pioneer initiative, has changed the scenario of neglected tropical diseases drug discovery in Brazil. 
Thank you, DNDI. Thank you, Sérgio, Charlie, Jadel, Luisa. It's been a great experience for me. And after 10 years of collaboration, I'm motivated and enthusiastic to learn new things and go to my lab every day to work with my students and postdocs in this project. Thank you. Professor Carolina uh, borsoi Morai from USP. Uh, Carolina obtained her PhD in microbiology and immunology from the Federal University. And during her postdoc at the Institute of Pasteur in Korea, she led projects in high throughput phenotypic screening and assay development for, for drug discovery for neglected diseases, especially for Chagas disease. She currently leads a research group at the School of Pharmaceutical Sciences at USP and her research focuses on the application of efficacy models for drug discovery for infectious diseases and mechanism of action studies using diverse cellular and molecular techniques, including high content screening, in vivo models, and single cell sequencing. Carolina. So, um, thank you. hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation to be here today. I uh, don't have, I didn't prepare a speech, <laughs> so I just talk from uh, my mind and my heart. Uh, my story with the NDI began in 2009. As Charlie said, I was working in the Institute Pasteur in Korea. And I was uh, first working in high throughput screening. So uh, it was a very exciting time for me when I learned uh, first to work on this and to be able to you know, participate in the drug discovery project. Uh, then after some years, I came back to Brazil and uh, together with uh, Lucio Freitas, who is my partner in life and work, and also has been part of this project. And uh, we came back because we wanted to do this kind of stuff and working relevant drug discovery projects here. So uh, I'm very grateful for the NDI because the NDI uh, has always believed in me, in my research group, in my potential to, to contribute over the years across different countries, different institutions, and has contributed to uh, also, uh, not only financially, but also intellectually to the research I do, and has helped um, funding the, uh, many students over the years as well. So this has been really great for us. And also I thank the team members that have helped us develop all this work during the years. Okay, so I, I'm really thankful to you for all the opportunities and I'm very happy to be here working this project now. I also <laughs> kind of emotive person, so I don't want to extend too much here, but thanks for the invitation. And, uh, let's go because we have many challenges to, <laughs> to face and I'm happy to be able to contribute to this. Thank you. And so we're going to hear first from Raphael. Uh, Dr. Raphael Ferreira is a lead application scientist. He's uh, originally a chemist from the State University of Campinas, a Unicamp, uh, with both a master's and a PhD uh, in chemistry from the same university, working on drug discovery for neglected tropical diseases under the supervision of uh, Professor Luis Diaz. Over the last four years, he's been working uh, in the agrochemical market, 
bringing inno innovative products to the market, as well as providing support and training to customers on a business-to-business -business environment. So, Raphael, over to you. And good morning, everyone. Thank you, Charlie, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Organizing Committee, for inviting me here to be talking to you. So today I'll be talking about my journey into drug discovery with DNDI. Uh, but before starting, I just wanted to, to introduce a little bit about myself before joining uh, the DNDI consortia. So um, as, as Charlie said, I am a chemist from this university. And during my, my period as an undergraduate student, I had the opportunity of going to the United States in the extinct Science Without Borders program, uh, where I had the opportunity of studying different subjects and also doing some research, um, going to conferences and learning a little bit about uh, science. Uh, in the end, I had the opportunity of going to California to uh, work at Amgen, a biotechnological company, in the chemical process research and development. And this was my first time working with uh, organic synthesis, and I just fell in love with it. So I decided I wanted to study that in my life, and then coming back to Brazil in 2013, I uh, looked for Professor Luis Carlos Diaz for my master's. And I did it from 2014 to 2016. This was not yet with uh, DNDI, but it was already in the drug discovery area, uh, working in collaboration with Professor Adriano at the University of Sao Paulo. And this was a very good time and very beautiful uh, uh, research project. Now I can talk about my PhD, which was indeed with uh, DNDI. So uh, among other projects, I worked in this two series here. I'm not going to be able, because we don't have too much time, I'm not going to be able to enter in details, but I'm more than happy to discuss about the, the chemistry details if you, uh, if you want to talk about it. Uh, but what I want to mention here is the experience I got from the Lola uh, project and also from DNDI. So most important, I think, is uh, the network that DNDI has all over the world. So even though I was in Brazil, I was able to uh, connect with people from different institutions in different countries and different areas, DMPK, pharmacodynamics, parasitology, everything. Uh, thanks to the technology, we could be able to talk uh, through video conferences. Uh, and this was a very... Uh, unique opportunity so that I could learn more than just uh, synthetic organic chemistry, which was uh, the subject I was studying, but also about different, uh, different subjects. And this was very uh, enriching experience for me. Also during my period in the PhD, I had the opportunity of going to, uh, to the University of Dundee. And this is because uh, DNDI has so many connections and I uh, had the opportunity of, of knowing a few people and then I could go to, uh, to the drug discovery unit. There is the Welcome Center for Anti-Effectivist Research, and they have this beautiful program of training. And if you're interested, you can just access this, uh, this link over here, and there are several opportunities still for students, for postdocs, or for young professionals. Uh, there, I had the same opportunity of working with uh, cross areas, so uh, not only synthesis, but also different uh, subjects. And one very good opportunity there is that everything is in the same building. So I was, for example, sitting right beside the biologist who was doing the, the tests of my compounds. And this is amazing. Um, so this is my experience. I, I don't have too much time. So this is my experience within Lola. But this has impact in my life not only during that time. Up to today, we have still uh, some impacts of Lola in my life. So. This is just to, to highlight some of the achievements that I had as a PhD student because of this collaboration. So some papers, some presentations, uh, all, everything was possible because I had so many great people working uh, with me. This is not only synthetic chemistry uh, work. It's a very, very large uh, collaboration team. So this was possible only because of that. And now to talk about my life post Lola, I have just uh, this slide. So after coming to Brazil uh, in 2019, after spending my period in the University of Dundee, I went to the private uh, initiative. 
I joined Oxiteno, which is now part of Indorama Ventures. And then I started working with uh, agrochemistry. Uh, even though it's not, uh, it's not in the academia or drug discovery, I still have the opportunity up to today uh, that I am a scientist at Croda, a British company that has uh, still uh, working in, in the agrochemical market. Although there is a pharma, a Croda Pharma uh, department, which has many collaborations with pharmaceutical, pharma, uh, pharmachemistry. So if you have any interests, just uh, you can talk to me and I can direct you to the right people over there. But um, besides going to the, the private initiative, I still had the opportunity of doing some scientific research in the, that environment. So I still have some papers, uh, some patents and book chapters, and this is possible because I, I, I feel like I grew up so much when I was doing my master's, my PhD, and all the, the experiences that I have. So this is uh, pretty much everything I wanted to share with you, and I couldn't leave this, this symposium without thanking a few people. So uh, there are so many people that I wanted to, to thank, but I don't have time, so I'm just gonna show a few of these people. So some people from uh, the University of Dundee that I worked with, I cannot, uh, I don't, I, I have to mention uh, Susan Farrell, which is here, and also Lauren Webster, because they do a very uh, beautiful job in the training program. I also have to thank Luis and all the team members. This is at the time I was uh, during my PhD. Uh, I have to thank Marco, Pablo, and Celso for their help uh, during my scientific growth. And also the DNDI that I represent here by Jadel and Charlie. Thank you very much and, and thank you all for your attention and if you have any questions we can talk about later and thank you for everything. Another example, we're going to hear from um, Dr. Maria Cruz Molo. Uh, she's an assistant researcher at CONICET in Argentina. She's a pharmacist by training and got a PhD at the University of Buenos Aires. And during 20, 2021 and 2022, she was part of the, the Lola team in Unicamp as a postdoc researcher working on early stage drug discovery for Chagas disease and actively involved in data analysis, compound design and synthesis. Currently, she's a researcher at Conocet and part of the drug discovery team um, at the Sibion Center in Argentina. Her uh, primary research focus is on phenotypic approaches and multiparametric multi optimization campaigns for discovering antiviral agents for viral neglected diseases such as dengue, Zika, and chikungunya. So let's hear from Maria. Well, thanks for the presentation. I want to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, this celebration. Uh, I'll present my, uh, my experience in LOLA project and also how it helps me in my scientific career. How I can pass this? Uh, oh, sorry. Well, uh, as Charles said, I am pharmacist by training and I did my PhD and two postdocs at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, I'm, my background is organic synthesis and, I, and during my postdoc, I, I made two internships with uh, Professor Andricopoulos at the USP uh, where I tested my compounds in Leishmania and then I found that they were part of LOLA projects. Uh, one year later, I was able to apply for a postdoctoral position with uh, Professor Luis Carlos Diaz, and I stayed there for two years. And currently, I'm, part, I'm an assistant researcher at CONICET. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry. I have problems with this. Well, um, I was selected by the, by the DNDI and also by the FAPES for the fellowship, and I started in January 2021. Um, as you may know, LOLA project was mainly focused on the early stage 
of that drug discovery. We work in hit to lead um, projects and the workflow involves several uh, many essays, collaborators and partners. At Unicam we were um, focused on synthesis but we were all involved in the decision steps of the optimization cycles. Uh, this uh, was very challenging for me because I had to learn a lot about medici medicinal chemistry strategies to um, obtain not only a patent compound, but also a compound with very good physicochemical and pharmacokinetic properties that merit the progression to the next steps. I work in this period with one uh, hit to lead series and also with a two hit assessment series. And well, here is a photo of the group at that moment. I want to take a minute to, um, to thank all my lab mates uh, who were with me at that moment. And um, some of us started the, the postdoc during the pandemic and Shadela and Luis worked very hard to maintain a balance between continuing to research and also to take care of our health and I want to thank for this also. And well, here is the MMB group and also the DNDI group. And there is Luisa, that it was great to see her, uh, her process in which she became part of the DNDI as a coordinator and see what, which other uh, opportunities a postdoc have, could have. Um, well, and um, besides the lab work, the DNDI strongly is encourages us to train as medicinal chemists. Uh, the group meetings were uh, part of this as we exchange ideas with great, great scientists as, Char as Charlie, Peter, also Lori, and our USP colleagues. And well, I also attended the real medicinal <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> and I also attended the Drew Medicinal uh, Chemistry School that was online because of the pandemic, but I also attended the um, physical aspect of a small molecule drug discovery um, uh, course that it was at the UK. It was a very good experience, and I'm very happy because it's going to be delivered, delivered also uh, this year in Campinas. Um, I also uh, participated in the Brass Med Chem, where I uh, presented my results on the multiparametric optimization of benzoxacinone series. And we also published a review uh, about the, the different uh, research um, projects in academia in uh, Chagas disease. We are also working in three manuscripts that uh, hopefully, we will publish soon. Uh, so I finish uh, my my, PhD, my my postdoc, and I come back to Argentina to put into context where I'm now. Um, this, in the scientific system in Argentina, we have a Ministry of Science and Technology, and that uh, it has two entities. In entities, one is CONICET, that uh, is the employees. From, for the researchers and also the, the agencia that is the source of funding. As you can see here in the timeline, is at least um, eight year career and every step is uh, evaluated very rigorously and it's a little bit difficult to become an, <laughs> a researcher. So uh, now I'm at this point as an assistant researcher I joined a medicinal chemistry laboratory uh, where Mariela Boschini is the PI. Here is the photo of the group. And I worked in the Center of Innovation in Bio Nanoscience, that is this building. And what is very good is that we have all the facilities to conduct a synthesis and also to um, perform the, uh, pharma the pharmaco. Uh, physicochemical and pharmacocinetic uh, essays. Um, so I moved from parasitic to viral neglected diseases. Uh, now I'm working with chikungunya and dengue. Dr. Mariela Boschini has very successful um, 
me medicinal chemistry projects with this, but they are most, mostly uh, target-based, and now my contribution to the group is to start uh, phenotypic drug discovery projects. Um, our main collaborators are Dr. Diego Álvarez and Dr. Eliana Castro from the University of San Martín, and they have a very well-equipped laboratory where they uh, do the conduct the um, antiviral uh, antiviral studies, the mode of action studies, and the target identification. Dr. Eliana Castro is also screening the MMB pandemic response, response box, and uh, regarding dengue, I'm screening the MMB global health priority box in dengue proteasis. Uh, we are having nice results, and we hope to move uh, soon to the antiviral and the, uh, the cytotoxicity assays. And well, uh, as a conclusion, uh, LOLA projects brings to me the opportunity of gain experience as a medicinal chemist and to have new ideas for new projects. I want to highlight again the, um, the possibility of high quality training that uh, the, DNDI, the DNDI provided me and the possibility to establish collaborations and networking. And well, as an Argentinian, I know that Latin America um, scientific system has a lot of challenges, but uh, projects like LOLA gives the opportunity uh, to have uh, these projects as a model and serves as uh, to expand the frontiers of medicinal chemistry in the region. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and also a little bit different from what I'm used to talking about chemistry. So we're going to talk about the strategic plan of the NDI. Um, so you can see here a summary of what we plan to do, or we've been planning to do since 2021 to 2028. Uh, so Louise already said, uh, Jadel too, that we, we, have, we have delivered so far 12 treatments, but we want to deliver more. We want to deliver 15 to 18 uh, treatments until 2028 to be a total of 25 uh, in 2028, so it'll be 25 in 25 years. And of course, our first uh, strategic imperative is to deliver new treatments and expand access for neglected patients, but not only to for neglected uh, tropical diseases like Chagas disease or leishmaniasis, but also pandemic prone and climate change sensi climate, climate sensitive diseases. For now, if you look to our portfolio, I don't think we've, we've shown so, so far yet the, the, our portfolio, but you, we plan to do this uh, 15 to 18 treatments. Uh, 10 to 12 will be from mature portfolio, that is already there. But we also want to do five to seven from uh, early stage and new chemical entities. So this is the, our, the, the first strategic uh, imperative. But we have other, we have other, other, other goals too. Second, that we want to use public health leaders in R&D. Uh, we want to, to connect them and connect with these actors, stakeholders in low and middle income countries. We want to contribute to build a proactive agenda for child uh, health and, and gender responsive R&D. Professor uh, Elena already said that, that we need to be, uh, when, when we think about R&D, we need to think about uh, those uh, populations too. We want to leverage new technologies, new therapeutic modalities, AI is here to stay, so we want to use that in our programs too. And here I'm gonna talk about, and I want to focus from now on, is to an open science, and champion open science in transparency. Uh, it's one of our strategic imperatives at the NDI. And I'm, I'm very proud to be, to be the coordinator of one of our projects, uh, the, the Open Innovation, or what we call Open Innovation Project at the NDI, which is the uh, Open Synthesis Network, uh, but they're also um, the, the NTD Drug Discovery Booster. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. And of course, using integrating AI projects into our uh, drug discovery portfolio. First of all, is the, uh, one of our ideas is the NTD Drug Discovery Booster, which is a open innovation, not totally open science, is open within the project, I guess. A kind of open, not totally open. Um, maybe even uh, Mike uh, can, Mike or uh, Dr. Mike uh, Shrimp or Dr. Fabian from ASI, they can, they can tell you a, bit, a little bit about that because they've been, uh, AbV and ASI have been uh, partners in this project. So what means the, the booster is just a global, uh, oh, this is dangerous, yeah. Um, a global consortium of uh, pharmaceutical companies trying to speed up the process of cutting uh, costs to find treatments for Leishmaniasis and Chagas, it's been focused on Leishmaniasis and Chagas disease. And how it works that we, we call a seeds we send them to these uh, companies, they look into the library compounds through like computational methods, and they, they found similar compounds, they test it, and they do iterative uh, cycles uh, of that. They do like, I think it was most, at most three iterative cycles for each seed. And then looking for better hits, looking for new hits, and looking for ultimately for a, for a hit series. We've been, now it's on hold, but we did this with 22 seeds and 45 iterative cycles. I think more than 10 uh, showed some um, in vivo proof of concept into Chagas disease. I think two in models for leishmaniasis. Now it's on hold to, to focus on progressing these into more advanced projects. Um, and, the, and the other project that we have in the so-called open innovation part is the Open Synthesis Network, which is the one I coordinate. Um, it's, um, if, you've been, if you have any sort of organic chemistry formal training, you probably, uh, in a lab, in a teaching lab, you probably synthesize aspirin or, I don't know, any other compound just to, to get the skills, just to be training the art of organic synthesis. And then probably you just discarded that, that compound, you just discarded that, um, that what, what you made. And what Ben Perry, Benjamin Perry, our former colleague from DNDI, thought is that 
maybe we can use this um, teaching lab facilities to expose students, undergrad students, to NTDs, expose students to the drug discovery model, and of course to GNDI. So we have now the Open Synthesis Network, which is an undergrad, which is to expose masters and undergrad students to this uh, project. And basically what it means is that we have a website at the NDI, very simple. We have chemical series there, we have data, we have a, a spreadsheet of target compounds, we have the data of that we already have for the series, and any undergrad institution or master projects can go there look at it and start the, their, their own uh, project too. Of course, it's tailored for undergrad teaching labs, which is great to have many, many universities doing that all over the globe. The data is deposited uh, in real time, so anyone can join the project, and I encourage you if you're interested, if you're, if you're dealing with undergrad teaching, this is a great project to, to expose students to NTDs and to drug discovery. And a little bit different from the, from the booster and from the, from the Open Synthesis Network, uh, um, we are launching here the Open Chagas. I know that in the program is Open Lola, but we changed the name to, to this. So as, as I said, this is still work in progress. Um, the, open, the Open Chagas will be an open channel between D and DI, and for now, uh, the Latin drug discovery community. So we want Drug, dis drug discovery researchers in Latin America to come to us and say like, we have this series, we have this data, what do you think about this, um, how can we progress? And we want to make that structured, of course, and we'll make that uh, a channel to, for us to, to dis identify new chemical series for researchers to show the, their data to us. We want to, to expose the researchers to to training, to mentoring, drug discovery awareness, as, as we all said here, the Lola started with this, smaller, with only chemistry, but then you go expanding, you, you know how important it is to measure ADME, DMPK properties early on. So it, you want, we, we, want to, uh, we want other groups to, to have that same idea. And of course, this is also part of our plan, that's why I, I, I started with the strategic plan. So this is part of our pillar one. We innovate to save lives. We want to discover new, new compounds to treat. In this, in this case, Chagas disease. It's part of our pillar two. We want to work with uh, endemic areas. We want to bring end-to-end -end drug discovery to endemic regions in endemic areas. And, uh, and again, we want to do the translational research, how to transform basic knowledge, basic research into a health product that will benefit uh, patients. How are we going to do that? Uh, this is kind of very brief, briefly the, the way we are going to do this. So survey stage, we are, we are calling this the three stages. First one is a survey stage, uh, ve very basic structure form to be online probably. Uh, a little bit if you're familiar with MMV projects will be something similar to that. Uh, researchers from, from uh, Latin American countries, they will be able to send us the, their data, their compounds, there will be confidentiality clauses, of course. Um, and then DNDI will return structured uh, feedback to selected applicants. Uh, this means that we don't know how many applicants we get, if we get any, but the idea here is for us to, to talk to them and say, like, this is uh, like progressible, you can do this, you can do that just giving them ideas on how to, how to progress a project regarding maturity, novelty, potential and progression. Uh, stage two will be a validation stage, maybe between six months and one year. We want uh, for selected proposals, again, we don't know the, how many we will get, but we want to offer some in-kind support from our Lola network. We do have resources here, we want to use them, we want to bring those resources to other, other states, other, other countries, I know that you know that Lola is it's only a Sao Paulo state at this point, but we want to expand that to other states in Brazil, we want to expand that to other countries in Latin America, and that's how we want to, to plan to do that. This will be a comp an informal collaboration comprising experimental work to profile hits and leads against DNDI TCP, the, the work that we have here uh, uh, in Sao Paulo at Lola, and also bring, like, bring together a network for training and mentoring these researchers. 
And what we call it the, the consolidation stage is that if everything goes well, if, if we think that we have a chance to progress the series and we have maybe fundraising opportunities together, then we can uh, work to more like a formal collaboration and be part of the Lolo team. So this is it for me. Uh, it's still very much uh, an idea. We do hope to, to launch it um, maybe early, early next year, maybe after Carnival or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but this is the idea. It will be a way to, for researchers to come to DNDI and, and DNDI to connect and map what's going on for Chagas disease in the, in the region. This is it. Thank you. Our first to speak, Dr. Laurie Ferrins, is a research associate professor of Northeastern University at the United States. Her research focuses on the development of drugs of intractable disease, including parasitic neglected tropical disease and antifungal agents. She collaborates with industry, public and private partnerships, government and academic groups to deliver better treatments to patients faster. To do this, her research relies on advanced models of infection to improve the translation of in vitro activity to in vivo efficacy, while also employing the tenets of phenotypic and the target driven optimization. Our second speaker, Professor Kevin Reed, who participates in this section remotely by Zoom platform, is the chair of quantitative pharmacology and head of GMPK in the Drug Discovery Unit at the University of Dundee, Scotland, UK. Dr. Kevin has extensive experience of early phase drug discovery, lead optimization, project leadership, and preclinical development. As a GMPK leader with expertise in central nervous system and anti-infective drug discovery, Dr. Kevin has activity a considerable track record of success, uh, playing a significant part in 11 compounds entering preclinical development, eight of which have entered clinical trials. Our third speaker, Dr. Manuel Ibarra, is a full professor of pharmaceutical science department at the School of Chemistry at the Universidad de la República of Uruguay and the director of the university's bioavailability and bioequivalence center for medicine evaluation. His research is focused on exploring and developing pharmacometric models in basic and applied pharmacological research aimed to understanding of specific pharmacokinetic process and translational application. Dr. Isbarra is also a co-founder and a coordinator of the Ibero-American Pharmacometric Network. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Peter Shaw. Dr. Peter is the head of the Discovery Project at the Drug for Neglected Disease Initiative, GNGI, in Geneva, Switzerland, with a focus on the discovery and development of novel antiparasite and antiviral drug treatments uh, targeting neglected patients. He has multiple years of industrial experience from medicinal chemistry applied to projects aimed at the discovery of novel treatments for infectious, respiratory, and anti-inflammatory disease. At this point, I think I need to introduce myself also, no? I'm Lydia Lima, a full professor of Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, and I have the pleasure to invite our first speaker, Professor Lori, to begin her talk. Professor, the floor is yours. All right. Hello. Ah, excellent. Hi, everyone. It is such a pleasure for me to be here today to speak to you all and to celebrate 10 years of Lola. Uh, I am most honored to be part of this 
wonderful community and this beautiful collaboration. So thank you to Jadel, Louisa and Luis for welcoming me and my team uh, into, this, uh, into this collaboration. So today, I am going to talk to you very briefly uh, about one of the projects that's been going on in our lab. Uh, I'm looking in the moment to see if I can find Hamon. Yes. Up in the back corner is Hamon. So Hamon is actually a vi uh, was a visiting PhD student with us for 12 months. He came from Luis's lab. Uh, he is a phenomenal person. If anyone's looking to hire a postdoc in the future, <laughs> hands off, he's mine. <laughs> uh, so Jadel and Louisa asked me to kind of set the scene for this coming session, and so that's what I'm going to try and do for you right now. So. I apologize that my titles are a little high for the Zoom window. Uh, so we all know that drug discovery is an incredibly expensive endeavor. And we're trying to do it with minimal resources in, uh, for diseases that affect some of the poorest communities. So I found this figure. Uh, the current average cost to bring a drug to the clinic is 2.3 billion American dollars. Uh, by the way, I'm Australian. That is the accent that you're hearing, not American. Uh, so 2.3 billion American. And those costs are projected to increase. Research and development costs are continuing to rise. We have increased uh, expenses from resources. We have increased expenses for us as people. Uh, and so it's certainly not going to get any better. There was a study done a few years ago now, actually nine years ago now, uh, which looked at the uh, progression of compounds uh, and their approvals. Ah, there it goes. Uh, so what you can see here is they looked at uh, two years, 1991 and 2000. And they looked at the number of compounds that progressed through to the clinic versus the ones that failed. So here we have uh, compounds that did not pass clinical trials, but uh, actually failed due to efficacy issues. More staggering, though, is actually this difference right here. And the difference is, from 1991 to 2000, pharmaceutical companies actually started started to incorporate ADME profiling, so absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination into their screening cascades. And you can see that what is actually happening here is we're having a much better effect or outcome in terms of clinical progression. Uh, so, I'm a medicinal chemist. My role in this, I'm very much at the early end, just like Louise's. Uh, so really, my goal with any project is to be able to optimize the chemical matter that I'm given. I'm thinking about optimizing potency, solubility, metabolism, everything that goes into making a drug-like compound, whatever your definition of drug-like compound might be. Uh, and I'm going to just show you very briefly how Hamon was actually able to do some of that in, in the context of our lab. So this is an example screening cascade uh, for a project that we've had running in the lab now for a number of years. So compound design and synthesis is actually happening at Northeastern on this one. Uh, we actually collaborate with the Spanish National Research Council, CSIC. They're really obtaining all of our toxicity, our T. cruzi, so this is a, a Chagas disease and human African trypanosomiasis project. So T. cruzi and T. brucei in vitro data. AstraZeneca actually provides an in-kind contribution of tier one ADME for every single compound that is made in support of this program. It's, uh, I was talking to Mike just before, this is a, it's a phenomenal contribution and we're incredibly grateful to them for doing this. Uh, we also have secondary assays already set up, rate of action, cytality, and then once we manage to check off all of those boxes, that's when we can really start to think about going into uh, PK studies, tolerability, and I, I believe Kevin's talk is really going to kind of talk a bit more about that in a moment. 
So AZD 5438, uh, this was a compound that is a known human CDK and GSK3 beta inhibitor. Uh, the, the ult ultimately, this compound didn't make it. It's one of those ones that doesn't make it past uh, clinical development. Uh, and it was discontinued due to tolerability issues, so over extended periods of time, it wasn't well tolerated, uh, and also exposure problems. So in this context, AZD5438, I'm showing you here uh, its starting uh, profile. So against T. brucei, causative agent of human African trypanosomiasis, we have really great potency. We have high lipophilic ligand deficiency that's telling us that we have meaningful interactions between our compound and whatever the target might be. Uh, we also have really potent activity against Trypanosoma cruzi, again, with really good lipophilic ligand deficiency. We have pretty good selectivity versus MRC5 and L6 cell lines. Uh, and we're actually in a, a pretty good spot in terms of some of our physicochemical properties. And what we wanted to do was to take this series, explore structure activity relationships, and then also start thinking about structure property relationships. Can we improve the tolerability? Can we improve exposure in this, in this uh, chemotype? So there's a number of strategies that we can use uh, to do this and to impact physicochemical properties in general. We can think about adding solubilizing groups, particularly beneficial if we know what the target is. Uh, we can add charge and polarity to our molecule such that it's protonated at physiological pH. We can add three-dimensional shape. Uh, those are all the things that I can do and that medicinal chemists can do. But if all else fails, uh, formulation is, is certainly something that we can turn to um, in the future. So briefly, I'm gonna to talk to you about what some of Hamon's work. Uh, so I hadn't realized that CQ Med is actually also located on this campus, uh, and we do collaborate with CQ Med. Again, this was an introduction that was actually made via Jadel. Uh, so uh, through Raphael and Priscilla, who's here today, uh, they actually had, we had a hypothesis that AZD5438 might also inhibit parasitic uh, GSK3 beta. They were actually able to crystallize AZD5438. And what you can see here is this part of the molecule is actually solvent exposed. And so the first compounds that Hamon made when he actually came to the lab was really focused on introducing sp3 character, uh, group, increasing, increasing polarity, uh, and really trying to take advantage of, of, that, of that space. And you can see that he was actually largely successful. So 7891 here, we've replaced our sulfonamide, we've added this uh, pendant ether. We now have a compound that maintains po excellent potency against T. brucei. We have had a little, a, a slight decrease in our T. cruzi activity, but that's um, actually increased our solubility. Um, we also have uh, 7906 with this uh, pendant dimethylamine. Uh, this one actually were at almost millimolar solubility. And so this for us was a really exciting um, discovery. Again, we're maintaining our potency against T. brucei and T. cruzi, and so really starting to give us opportunities to move forward. I will just point out really quickly, this strategy doesn't always work. Uh, so with 7905, here you can see that actually our solubility didn't really translate very well to, uh, to an increase that we were, that we were happy with. Uh, some other very brief examples, we can add charge and polarity, again, really taking advantage of that vector that we thought would be solvent exposed. We can add basic amines. Uh, we can, uh, you'll note, I've also included 7906 on this slide. And the reason that I am doing that is because what I'm trying to emphasize here is making one structural change to a molecule can have multiple impacts. And so that kind of comes back to this this multi-parameter optimization that we were talking about before, uh, and, and how that actually complicates our analysis of the data. It's certainly not always successful. Uh, uh, so this, 
Uh, Bok protected intermediate was actually sent for testing, and what you can see here is uh, we've actually completely lost our aqueous solubility. So it certainly is uh, compound dependent. It's not there, okay. Uh, and then my final set of examples was uh, to also introduce flexibility. So again, we had a look at seeing if we could actually move this functional group out uh, of the binding pocket, well, extend it out uh, into solvent exposed space. Uh, largely unsuccessful in, sorry, uh, moderately successful, I mean, it, it meets our criteria, but certainly wasn't at the millimolar solubility that we'd seen previously with some of our other compounds. But we'd also explored uh, varying the substitutions off of the pyrazole group and then also increasing SP3 content uh, in the actual binding pocket itself. And this is where you can see that in, in terms of this particular program, we started to see differentiating activity between T. brucei and T. cruzi. Uh, so some of these modifications were certainly much more well tolerated in T. brucei. Though one of the questions that we have, given that the assay is intracellular in T. cruzi, is really whether this is actually a, a byproduct of a lack of permeability or a, a lack of uh, efficacy. So I hope I've been able to very quickly show you that uh, a medicinal chemist is really responsible for trying to optimize uh, for potency, solubility, and permeability on any program that we work on. Uh, our goal is to decrease the efflux and the metabolism. I certainly didn't talk about that, uh, but I would be happy to go into that information with you. It's certainly on my slides. Uh, and to increase exposure and half-life of compound. Again, multiple parameters are often changing with any single modification that we make to a compound. And that ultimately makes interpretation very complex. Our responsibility is also to understand that in vitro to in vivo correlation between the assays, which is certainly much more challenging in something like Chagas disease. And then my final point that I wanted to really make is that contributions from industry collaborators are really vital to the success of programs like this. Uh, without the support of AstraZeneca and other companies, uh, our lab certainly wouldn't be able to do sort of the research that we're doing at the moment. With that, I would really just like to shout out again, Hamon, uh, for being uh, a wonderful team member when he came to us for 12 months. I've also presented some work from Naresh Gunaganti, who was a postdoc in the research lab. Uh, I'd like to again thank uh, Priscilla and Raphael uh, for their collaboration. Uh, Jadel and Louisa, uh, as well as to the NIH, were incredibly well funded. Uh, so thank you again, uh, and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. You know, my sincere apologies for not being there with you in person. You know, my intention was to be there until earlier this week, but unfortunately, a health issue in the family has now prevented me from traveling. So I won't unfortunately be able to, to share in the celebrations for Lola's 10 year anniversary, but I wish you all a great conference and, uh, and good discussions. So I'm now going to cut off my face uh, from the presentation because I'm only going to block uh, key points on most of my slides if I if I leave my face in the corner. So when you start any new anti-infective drug discovery program, there's some key questions you need to uh, need to ask. Where are those pathogens localized? You know, where is that infection? And are there likely to be reservoirs of these parasites uh, which are more resistant to drug treatment? When you know where they're localized, you then need to obviously develop compounds that can reach all the sites of infection and get to a point where we understand the pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic relationship as quickly as we can so that we can then be better at just triaging 
those compounds that are most likely to give full cures into the disease model. It just makes the whole drug discovery process nimbler when you have a good understanding of the drug concentration requ profile requirements needed for drug effect. And yes, this is a DMPK talk, so they're the key components, but we mustn't also forget mode of action. You know, I won't be talking about this today, but you know, we will only want to be working on those compound series that can kill all forms of the parasite if indeed multiple forms exist. You know, are there persister dormant forms? And if there are, make sure that you have the right in vitro assays, you know, washout assays, etc., that gives you confidence that that chemistry that you're working on has the ability, at least in vitro, to kill all forms of the parasite. So in Chagas disease, uh, the bioluminescent mouse model is the uh, go-to model for efficacy now, developed by Michael Lewis in John Kelly's lab in the London School of Tropical Medicine. Now, this is Trypanosoma cruzi uh, with luciferase, uh, transfected with luciferase so that when you inject luciferin, you and monitor with an IVIS imager, you can just see the bioluminescence nice and nice and easily. Now in this model, you know, in acute disease, the parasites are everywhere, you know, particularly when you look ex vivo here on the button down on the, uh, the left hand side. And then as the, as the disease progresses into more chronic stages of the disease, the parasite distribution, when you look at vivo, tends to be more usual in the stomach and the colon, but occasionally we will see it in visceral fat, so occasionally we will see it come up in ovaries, occasionally we will see it come up in lymph nodes, there's literature reports in the brain. Also in chronic disease, if you monitor the animals daily, you can see foci of parasites popping up on a daily basis in different places. So it becomes very clear that if you're going to get a effective treatment at curing this disease you need a compound that extensively distributes around the body to reach where all the parasites are. So I highlighted some pretty challenging tissues for compound distribution. You know visceral fat it's a big component of the body but has very very poor blood flow to it so actually getting deep penetration into visceral fat can be challenging. Uh, for compounds. You know, I've also talked about conserved sites. You know, if the compound needs to get into the brain, it's got to have the right physchem properties to get across the blood brain barrier. We see parasites in the ovary. Are they actually in the developing egg phases? So across the blood follicular barrier, if they are, then the same property requirements are needed as they would be to get across the blood brain barrier. And we often see parasites in the lymph nodes. Is this just because they're trafficking at the time, or is there a reservoir in the lymph nodes? In which case, you know, will the lymphatic, some level of lymphatic delivery help us better cure? And to do that, you generally need more lipophilic compounds with the associated development problems that come with that. So there's some challenging t tissues for distribution. So not surprisingly, the first DMPK challenge in Chagas disease is compound distribution. You know, actually getting a compound with great blood pharmacokinetics may not be enough. We've also got to ensure that we have compounds that homogeneously distribute within all tissues. And to increase drug efficiency for this, we should minimize non-specific binding. So here's an example from one of our lead series where we've taken nine compounds from this series into efficacy. From our, our initial understanding of PKPD we needed to maintain unbound blood levels uh, well above the EC90 for at least 20 days in order to be able to deliver to deliver efficacy. And that was working for the first few compounds and we were getting full cure. But then as you can see we have four compounds here that only gave us partial cure 
even though the unbound blood levels were still well above the EC90 uh, for the whole uh, duration of dosing. So with these compounds we then went, those four compounds, we then measured uh, tissue levels, so a highly perfused tissue such as muscle and a very poorly perfused tissue such as adipose shown here. And we were able to get a better uh, correlation with the unbound, maintained unbound levels in these tissues um, in terms of understanding why we only achieve partial cure for these compounds versus full cure uh, for others even though the blood kinetics were excellent. And uh, you know, particularly for adipose, that differentiation was uh, was was clearly there. So, within the triaging in drug discovery program, we therefore needed to add uh, something else in. It wasn't just a matter of just getting good blood pharmacokinetics. We needed a better predictor also for tissue levels as well. But it's really laborious to routinely measure drug distribution in vivo, you know, taking tissues, extracting, homogenizing and measuring levels. So we need to leverage more rapid alternative in silico in vitro approaches to help uh, the triaging so that every compound we put in efficacy delivers uh, full cure. So here we can look at physiologically based PK modeling such as Gastro Plus, you know, because that can predict critical parameters such as tissue partition coefficient and volume distribution. Uh, but also we can look at unbound volume and drug efficiency index uh, which we can calculate from in vitro studies using biomimetic uh, chromatography as well. So I'll just talk a little bit about both of these. So using uh, PBPK uh, to predict distribution in Chagas disease and here I must stop and acknowledge David Sebrian who's a uh, the key driver of this work in, the, in GSK and Tres Cantos, you know, that is an expert in PVPK modeling. So that same lead series I was talking about a minute ago, you know, we took 10 of those compounds and actually measured adipose levels and then using PVPK modeling, we actually also predicted the adipose levels and actually the prediction was pretty reliable. There was one notable exception, but we could explain that from uh, an issue with the PK uh, from the actual measured measured data. So this then gave us confidence that we could use this PVK Gastro Plus model to predict concentration of drug in adipose, and therefore that combined with good blood kinetics likely cure rate for the series and therefore more effective prioritization of compounds that should deliver us full cures every time. Now the important thing with PBK modeling is to have inputs that don't need experimental data, but of course for what we needed in order to be able to, to predict uh, plasma and tissue levels, metabolic stability is still very, very poorly predicted on the whole from any model. Um, so although we use predicted parameters, we still measure intrinsic clearance and experimentally with microsomes as the only experimental plug-in for that particular particular model now going forward. So the other approach we can use is to calculate unbound volume of distribution from in vitro data. So as you will be aware, we usually calculate unbound volume uh, from an intravenous pharmacokinetic experiment uh, correcting the blood levels for the blood tissue binding. But we can also predict unbound volume of distribution using biomimetic chromatography. Here using human serum albumin columns or an and an immobilized artificial membrane column to provide information on non-specific binding to protein and to lipid. So here with our compound of interest you just compare its retention to a known set of reference standards and then calculate the retention factor and use that in the equation below that's been published by Clara Valco and her team to predict the log of the unbound 
volume of distribution. And Clara and her team have validated this this approach, uh, you know, with a substantial amount of measured volume data. So now we have this unbound volume of distribution just from simple in vitro biometric chromatography experiments. We can take it one step further and calculate drug efficiency with it. Now I don't want to go through the details of the mathematics. I don't have uh, the time here, but uh, you know, I encourage you to look at uh, Simone Braggio's paper on drug efficiency. But we can use, as I say, this in vitro determined unbound volume to calculate drug efficiency that then gives us what we call a drug efficiency index by incorporating also the in vitro potency. Now taking you back to those nine uh, compounds where actually the measured adipose tissue gave us that better resolution of why even though they all had great blood pharmacokinetics um, some of them gave four cures and some didn't if we then take those nine compounds and calculate the drug efficiency index from the way that I've just described, you can also quite clearly see here uh, that there is equally as good a resolution as to why we're getting full cures or not when we have great blood pharmacokinetics and that through the drug efficiency index. And indeed, we now routinely, at very early in our drug discovery program, determine the drug efficiency index and use a DEI greater than seven to triage compounds into in vivo PK. So good drug efficiency index, great blood kinetics with unbound levels above EC90 combined, we should always now achieve cure. A second key challenge is that the Chagas disease model is a mouse. So let me explain. So here in a typical early drug discovery workflow, there's a lot of emphasis on getting metabolic stability in a mouse so that we then have good pharmacokinetics in mouse to be able to deliver efficacy in that mouse model of infection. Uh, but it's actually quite common that we actually have mouse specific metabolism issues. And these three examples are from one of our lead series, perfectly progressible compounds with good metabolic stability in rat and human but high metabolic instability in mouse. You know, this happens a lot. It can be a huge drain on drug discovery cycle times in order to try and overcome this and that to still then deliver that proof of concept efficacy in the, in the mouse when you have this challenge. And so yes, we have, we have ways of trying to, to sort of get by it. Uh, we can co-dose with amino bench triazole, which takes out the mouse sips and that hopefully will boost the exposure to get to where it needs for the efficacy. Or we could try and saturate our metabolism through ultra high uh, dosing to still then achieve the exposures that we want. Or you could implant osmotic pumps, but surgical intervention in a lot of animals for an efficacy study you know, is, is, a, is probably not the ideal way forward. So, so then the other options are you just drop these compounds when in all respects they're okay, or you invest make chem time fixing a mouse specific problem when they should be focusing on optimizing a drug for man and you could lose three to six months fixing, fixing such a mouse uh, specific uh, problem. So we need another way uh, forward to, to get around this. And thankfully, you know, there's now a robust humanized mouse model called the 8HUM mouse. This model was developed by Roland Wolf and his team here in Dundee. It took them the best part of 15 years uh, to do that with this model. But the advantage of this model over any other humanized mouse model for metabolism that is out there are that they've removed all of the mouse metabolizing cytochrome P450s. So you have a clear background, including also the mouse xenosensors, CAR and PXR, and replaced them with the human xenosensors and the key human drug metabolizing CYP450s. And also, this is in all tissues, not just liver. So if there's an extensive gut warmer metabolism component, that can also, that's also now uh, humanized with this model. So a very exciting model that could offer a great opportunity to bypass this uh, mouse specific metabolism uh, problem. 
So I must now at this point acknowledge the Tres Cantos Open Lab Foundation as they funded me for the last 18 months to, to really explore the 800 mouse as a, for its utility in early drug discovery. So of course one of the first things we wanted to do was see whether this mouse would be able to replace wild type mouse as the infection model. And thankfully in Chagas disease it's, it works very well. Uh, and can easily be replaced uh, with the wild type mouse. It is on a black background rather than a white background, so the signal is a little weaker, but in all other respects, um, it still works extremely well as a replacement for wild type mouse in the bioluminescence model. Now, outside of the scope of this uh, talk, you know, we're obviously very interested in replacing wild type mouse with the eight hum mouse in a range of different diseases and drug discovery efforts um, including tuberculosis and uh, viral diseases and we've been working with the DNDI and GSK um, in replace in looking at AHAM as a wild type replacement in some of those diseases uh, recently. So let's come back to our three compounds that are progressible but have high mouse specific metabolism problems. So instead of investing and losing medchem time on fixing a mouse specific problem, we now have a nice way to bypass this. So when you have compounds like X, Y and Z here, you now run the intrinsic clearance in the eight ham microsomes. And if the intrinsic clearance comes right down, as you can see here, so it's now below the, the lower limit of the dynamic range akin to, to human in the eight ham incubated with ACUM microsomes, then we can then progress those compounds to pharmacokinetics in the ACUM mouse. And as you can see for all three compounds, exposure levels over four days of dosing were maintained above the EC99 unbound uh, for the whole duration of dosing in, the, in red, which is what we wanted to see and we know we need for the for good PKPD. And as you you can also see here, if we were still using wild type mites, there was no way we would ever be able to get the exposures that could deliver efficacy in the wild type mites for any of those three compounds. And with those good PK profiles, we could then progress direct to polyluminescent efficacy of Chagas disease, chronic Chagas disease, with the eight hum mouse as the disease model. And for two of the three compounds, we achieved four cures which then allows us to then uh, move forward in the optimization program towards a uh, candidate nomination, saving significant time in, in mouse dealing with the mouse issue. So the AHAM mouse will, of course, also offer the potential for better translational uh, PKPD, simply because it produces a metabolite profile more akin uh, to human than to mouse. So if there's an active metabolite contribution to efficacy, then this could better be captured uh, from the AHAM mouse. And you know, I've done an extensive analysis of, of a whole range of compounds in microsomes from human, wild type mouse, and the AHAM mouse. And these are not just chosen because they're the best two, they're just good examples of what of a consistent pattern that we're seeing in terms of the AHAM offering a metabolite profile much more consistent uh, to human. So I just wanted to, to flag that as an additional added value potentially uh, for this model. So in summary, you know, it's clear that DMPK methodologies are essential for identifying the best compounds for progression to efficacy and delivering full cures in disease. Having DMPK expertise is critical to any drug discovery program to keep it uh, nimble. I've demonstrated that um, the use of PVPK and drug efficiency index are very useful for compound triaging to ensure that compounds that have great blood pharmacokinetics also have the right distributional properties uh, to hopefully deliver full cure and for using these minimal inputs are required 
sort of can be done very early in the drug discovery process. And then I've talked about the 800 mouse, you know, a potential game changer in early drug discovery, the fast proof of concept, maintaining lead optimization focus on human, not getting distracted with having to fix mouse specific problems. And clearly offering potential for translational improvement as well in efficacy to man. Now there wasn't time to talk about MAUD EMS, but clearly that is also a very important technology in understanding compound distribution, particularly homogeneity of compound distribution. And we're working with Peter Marshall and his team at GSK Stevenage in looking at MAUD approaches for actually marrying together compound distribution and parasite localization within the same sections. But that is a methodology that's very much under development. I'd like to thank all of my dear bigger team, a great group of innovative driven scientists and the much broader kinetoplastid drug discovery team. You know, it's the DDU, the partnership with GSK and the DNDI, particularly Jadel and Louisa and also the University of Washington with Fred Bruckner. Thank you for your attention. Hi, good morning. Well, uh, thank you, Lydia, for, for the presentation, for the introduction. And I want to start thanking the organizers, uh, Luisa, Luis Jadel, for inviting me to this great event. I'm very excited to be here um, learning from DNDI and the LOLA Consortium uh, efforts uh, in, this, in such an important uh, field. Uh, and how they, uh, it's also great to, to see how we share uh, the vision behind the, the, the capacity building in the region and, and among, among different areas of, of scientific knowledge. So uh, what, I will, what I will share with you is um, what the work that we, we've been doing in pharmacometrics in the region and in my country, in Uruguay. So let's go right, right into it. I am first would like to define and show you, discuss uh, what, is, what pharmacometrics is. How pharmacometrics has been defined as science of, of quantitative pharmacology. I, 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 I always like to, to say, um, pharmacometrics is a discipline based on um, the development and application of uh, computational models, computational models that integrate PKPD drug properties, patient characteristics, uh, biopharmaceutic uh, characteristics of the drug product, and characteristics of disease prog progression. And these models are able to integrate those characteristics quantitatively to uh, understand and characterize the dose exposure response variability at, it, at its different levels. And you may also hear about uh, pharmacometrics called um, as, as a field of modeling simulation or also biosimulation field, uh, because ultimately what we want to do with these models is to predict, to predict, sorry, okay, to predict uh, PKPD properties, to predict disease progression, to predict how the how drug will um, perform uh, in a patient. And so what, what type of, of model, what, what is a model? So what, 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 I, what I'm referring to with, with uh, computational models, these, these, these tools are conceptual tools that allow us uh, to translate complex systems um, into simplified forms, mathematical forms, uh, which we, which we can work with um, to generalize detail and summarize our information, integrate knowledge, data, and assumptions into a form that can be used to prove uh, alternative designs and outcomes during drug development and during the dose optimization process. Uh, sorry, this is, you know, this is, okay, I understand now. This is a not, a, not up to date uh, uh, presentation. But anyway, let's, let's keep with this. Um, so th this slide was not supposed to be here. Um, but so the, the idea behind these models and, and, and the importance of, the, of these models is to not, not only describe 
uh, the time course of, of the variable that we are um, that we are interested in. For instance, this is an example of uh, rat growth. Um, so how, how, how the rat gains weight uh, during different weeks and uh, among different uh, experimental designs. And you can use different type of equations to describe those, but as you see above, these uh, polynomial models do, do, do a good job describing the data, but they do a poor job extrapolating how, how, the, data, how the, the rat will grow after the, the, the observation period. And that's because those models do not uh, take into account what we know, what is plausible in the scientific knowledge about what we, uh, how we are understanding this process, this growth process. So the model, be, the, the model below allow this and, and not only so uses uh, uh, useful parameters, but it also um, helps uh, keep keep projections, more mechanistic projections. So uh, this is what we are looking for in, in pharmacometrics. So, the, so bringing scientific knowledge into a mathematical form allows, allows us not only to describe, but to project. And that's what we are aiming for. We, we want to project so we, we can describe pharmacokinetics for, uh, after, for instance, a, a, a 100 milligram dose, uh, but we are interested in predict what will happen if we double the dose or if we give the half of the dose and, or, or if we change the dosage regime. And not only we can do that this with PK models, we can also do this with PK and PD models and with disease progression models. So, it's not working? Okay. So the simulation is the ultimate goal of, of modeling and we can conduct in silico experiments to optimize, optimize design to estimate uh, missing observations and pro pro make projections, extrapolations for what, what can happen, uh, evaluate sensitivity of model output to non-controllable non -controllable inputs, and explore situations that will be ethically, financially, or physically impossible, uh, but that we, we, should, we, we have to do in order to provide valuable information. So the different models, and this is not working, okay. There are many different models, uh, right from, from PK models to PKPD models, model for disease progression, models for uh, quantitative systems pharmacology that helps uh, understand um, and, and validate targets uh, for, for, in, for the early phases of drug, drug discovery. And all of those uh, have to uh, integrate scientific knowledge and scientific information available. So this approach has been embraced by, by innovative pharmaceutical industry uh, up to a point that it is now called Model Informed Drug Development Paradigm, or MIDD, or also MID3, because if, if, you, uh, if we say Model Informed Drug Discovery and Development, so right from the, the early stages to the, to the to, uh, post-marketing stages, uh, these models are, are developed through, to inform decisions um, and improve, so accelerate the process and help, um, uh, yeah, help uh, make this process uh, more, more uh, help the effectiveness, the effectiveness of, of the decision making uh, throughout this process. And the, the nice thing about these models and the interesting thing is that they are really three platforms that can integrate knowledge uh, between the different uh, stages of drug development. Uh, we, the, there's, a, there's a concept that is learning, uh, learning and confirming because these models are being, uh, pu are being put into test uh, with each clinical trial or preclinical trial and every, every time we gather data, we can optimize, we can refine the models to move on. So the models are, are going through the whole process, uh, improving their, 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 capaci their capacity in predicting uh, what will happen with the drug, how will the drug will perform, and they, are, they get better in informing the critical decisions throughout uh, this process. And this is embraced not only by, by pharmaceutical industry, but also for, uh, from regulators. So, uh, uh, to put a, a, an example that we, we work on, um, uh, and we will be pre presenting in, in, in Brass Medchem uh, next week. Uh, this is a, a project led by Marcelo Gomini from Instituto Pasteur, uh, in which they, they had 35 or 36 candidates uh, which, with proven efficacy in vitro for uh, SARS-CoV-2. And so they, they want to prioritize those in order to move forward to a preclinical uh, study. And 
So we use uh, PVPK modeling, integrating in vitro, uh, uh, in vitro knowledge and using uh, machine learning methods to predict pharmacogenetic properties in order to simulate the PK profile, so the time course of concentrations at the target size, at the target site, sorry, uh, in order to predict what, so what dosage regime uh, should be, uh, cho should be um, implemented in order to observe the effect in a, in a, in a mouse model. And this helped to reduce the, the, this 35 um, uh, candidate lists in, uh, up to a five or six that uh, were for, for which the conditions were possible to, to, to perform in vitro. This other model also shows how so this is an anti-malaric, this is a nice example that shows that not only PK and PKPD properties of the drug can be integrated into, into the model, also kinetics of disease progression, this is kinetics of uh, parasite, parasite growth, can be integrated and uh, to inform, to simulate how different dosage regimes can, um, can, be, uh, can, can result to minimize, uh, so to choose the dosage regime that minimizes the probability of relapse. And Finally, or not finally, but uh, different models can also be used to improve the, the properties of the drug deliver delivery systems and also to make predictions uh, in, into specific populations. So MIDD is, is, used, is being used and is, is, is a really established paradigm. Um, but in, in Latin America, we have seen this from, from, from far away. It's, it's like I, I like to use this analogy of a mountain because uh, as this was pushed by innovative industry here in the region, uh, we, we have really, it's a very incipient uh, field. So the, uh, we have many challenges related to creating a critical mass working and, and being skilled in pharmacometrics. Right from, so we have to develop skills. We have to interact with the global community to uh, integrate knowledge. Uh, we have to retain pharmacometricians in, in our, so create capacity building in, in a sustainable way uh, and engage with non-academic sectors. And the way we have to do this, uh, or the, the conditions we have is um, within limited resources, as, as we all know, in the region. And so, uh, yes, I will pass by because this, oh, okay. So uh, opportunities, so we, have, we can support pharmaceutical innovation, uh, can support regulatory science, uh, make an impact in the clinical setting, and tackle neglected diseases and neglected populations. So the way that we are moving forward is to support solutions um, for regional healthcare issues, uh, promoting innovation and capacity building. And we have gathered in, a, in an international group that is called REDIF, uh, REDIF is an acronym for Ibero-American Pharma Pharmacometrics Network, um, that is all over Latin America and also groups from Spain and Portugal. Um, yeah, this, this was a previous this is like, uh, and, and yeah, so we have, we are conducted different activities, uh, scientific meetings and educational activities to move forward uh, with, the, with this discipline, but to ultimately uh, impact in, in what, what is the most important thing that is to bring uh, efficacy, eff effective and safe uh, treatments to patients. And, um, and this, uh, the, the neglected diseases are definitely one, one field and one area that uh, it would be great to, to, to jump in and to, to start collaborating from within the region. So, some take home, home message that, that I, I, mean, I think I'm, I'm past of time, so I will leave this uh, there. Uh, I think I will leave with the last point. We can use these tools to support pharmaceutical innovation. We are doing, we are collaborating with, with different uh, partners in, uh, in the region uh, to solve health, uh, regional healthcare issues. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and invite you for the meeting we have next year. Um, uh, this is the, the, the annual meeting for Rediff that is, will take place in Colombia next year. Thank you very much. Peter, please, it's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. So, thank you very much for, for the invitation, and I'm so pleased to be here to 
present the part of our work that uh, we did uh, during the pandemic. And um, I will, uh, it, this is a different tack on the need for kind of pharmacokinetic understanding. And this, um, this is applied to an investigation around how should we pre-qualify pre compounds or repurposing compounds with a greater pro uh, probability of achieving clinical efficacy. So, so, so as, as, as we all are painfully aware of, um, uh, a couple of years ago, 2020, COVID-19 was recognized as a significant threat to human health. Uh, and at the time, there were no efficacious treatments of the disease. We are all aware of that. And also, as you might remember, at the outset of the pandemic, there was a large number of clinical trials conducted uh, to identify drug treatments for COVID-19. Uh, most early studies they focused on covalescent plasma and uh, drug repurposing. It's uh, first during the, law, the late years of the pandemic where tailored treatments came into clinical trials. Uh, one year approximately after the declaration of pandemic, a staggering number of patients had been in clinical trials. So the number I have is 700, more than 700, probably many, many more were included in trials. Uh, and more than 60 compounds were explored. And, but the problem here is that very few of the compounds that entered into the clinical trials had any or very limited preclinical evidence that they actually should work when when you expose pa patients to the drugs. And the question that you could ask is whether this is ethical or not. Yeah? And also what should be remembered that most of the kind of early studies, they were poorly designed, they were kind of not powered enough to really answer the questions uh, uh, asked and, and, um, uh, and limit the chance to give kind of uh, uh, any kind of valid readout on the primary endpoint. Uh, just just a, a step back and say, why, why should you do r drug repurposing? Why not wait for the, for the new drugs? Of course, it's, it's urgent. You need to do something. So drug repurposing is a way to quickly respond to a disease threat. That's, that's clear. And also, you can fast track things because you have a lot of available information. You have tox data. You have kind of formulations. You have uh, safety. Uh, um, preclinical data supporting aspects of, of the drugs. And of course, there are some really good examples historically of drug repurposing. And you can think of thalidomide that has been kind of repurposed into treatment of leprosy. You have aspirin that is now used for kind of preventing blood clotting. You have dimethyl fumarate that has been repurposed into multiple sclerosis. So there are some good examples of drug repurposing. And also in COVID-19 early on, especially in treatment of severe patients, there was some kind of uh, really good findings that you could use the kind of anti-inflammatory agents uh, to kind of, kind of decrease the lethality in severe disease. But for antivirals, there were kind of very few examples, but a lot of compounds tried. And, and just, just to tell even if you do well-controlled studies, and this is example from the recovery studies where, the test, uh, where more than 40,000 patients were included in these platform studies, and they tested, have reported on uh, 12 compounds today, and in, in the studies only four of these showed efficacy against the primary endpoint. So it's a high attrition game, it's a high risk. Um, and only uh, three out of these claimed antiviral efficacy and out, out of these only one of the antivirals provided a clinical uh, effect on the primary readout. So you, you can ask a number of questions when you see this. So what were the level of preclinical evidence supporting progression uh, of the repurposed drug into patients? And what would it be, uh, be the ideal part to qualif qualify uh, a repurpose antiviral for clinical entry. And this is the, what we try to address. So 
our approach, so what did we do? Uh, there was a lot of compounds at the time proposed for or entered into clinical trials. So, of course, we, we reviewed all these. So, we identified the candidates based on literature and mainly we picked out the information from, uh, from um, uh, journals, from uh, regu reg regulatory files, etc. And then, in the second step, we uh, validated or verified the antiviral efficacy in preclinical models, first in vitro, and we also acquired uh, drug exposure in the relevant uh, in vivo systems. And in this case, we focused on hamster and mice models because at the time, and I think this is still the case, that Hamster was the kind of more see, perceived as the more relevant SARS-CoV-2 infection model, uh, and also lately mice has been more kind of used because it's easier, basically. Yeah, and then based on on the on the data generated, we modeled the human uh, dose match exposure in the preclinical species, and then we assessed the drug efficacy in the antiviral model. So a lot of kind of work to assess the compounds and generate the data needed to kind of firmly um, understand that the in vivo efficacy experiment we perform is relevant in the context of rep drug repurposing. Mm. And we did look on a lot of compounds. So in total, we looked on more on 88 compounds in the initial steps. We took. 26 of these into preclinical evaluation in vitro and in vivo and then finally we we tested quite a number of compounds in in the hamster PD model to understand the efficacy. We did also do a more limited set of uh, studies in mice models but I will not discuss this today. Yes and one of the important steps of course is to understand is the drug exposure in human relevant to what we achieve in the experimental species? And I, I have two examples here where we, uh, where we can follow this and, and also try to explain the methodolo methodology that we use to, to understand this. So first of all, we generated the PK data in hamster, so we at different doses to generate the input data for the modeling. And then we did look at the human, how the human uh, exposures at approved doses, how that positioned itself in contrast to the hamster exposure at different dose levels. So in, in the case of Favipiravir, which is a kind of not very potent inhibitor of SARS-CoV-2 activity. So it's, we are talking about a compound that has an IC50 of more than 50 micromolar, so it's not so, not so potent. But in any case, um, at the doses used in human, you can see that you can reach a human relevant exposure in hamster at fairly low dose, doses, uh, 25 milligram. And here we are using the Cmax level and AUC to kind of gauge if we are relevant in a relevant range or not. Of course, to fully understand the antiviral efficacy, you do need to model exposure over time with uh, with the aim to cover the uh, free EC90 at the dose you go into the animal. But this gives you a very good kind of indication of where you are. And you can also see that for favipiravir. Uh, you are at the human exposure. You are quite close to the, um, uh, the exposure, and this is expo uh, the IC50, and this is IC50, which is adjusted for to compensate for the plasma protein binding in hamster and also the plasma uh, the protein binding in the assay. So, so it's uh, it's adjusted IC50. So the there is a relevance for the human dose exposure related to the IC50. And then also uh, you can see that for the um, human exposure, actually you're underdosing 
uh, if you're using the approved doses in comparison to the human doses. But at least it's fair to say that in the experimental model you can have an exposure that should provide you with an effect, an antiviral effect in the peak PD model. And if we go to another there, so ivermectin, this is a compound that has been used by presidents in different countries, etc., to uh, prevent uh, COVID-19. But this is, this is an opposite case where, where, we, where it's clear that you will never, ever be able to dose this compound high enough in either you hamster or humans to provide an effect. So, so this, this is pretty clear that this will never work as a treatment, as an antiviral treatment. So. Uh, and then we did conduct the experiments in the hamster model according to this protocol. And here you can see that with ivermectin at the dose selected, we don't see any effect on, on, RNA, on um, virus levels or replicating viruses. For favipiravir, we do see an effect. Yeah. And then, okay, it's not a strong effect. So the other part which Kevin touched upon is that you need to be connected, well connected to a mechanism of action that is relevant to uh, the effect that you're after. And this is very clear when you look on, on the main protease inhibitors, the two approved, nimeltavir and, and sirtuvir. It's, you can, if you stay high enough in exposure, you get a very, very good effect, a dose-dependent effect. And this is, this is very clear for polymerase, polymerase inhibitors and for SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, MPRO inhibitors. So it's clear that, okay, you have, if you have a tight connection mechanistically, it's also an advantage. And this also kind of replicates in, in the kind of clinical out outcome. So WHO, WHO clearly uh, uh, do not recommend the use of ivermectin based on the clinical data, and this very well correlates to what you see in the animal models. Whilst for uh, Paxlovid, which is the combination of nemeltavir and uh, ritonavir, you have a strong recommendation for the use of of Paxlovid due to the clinical efficacy. So it correlates very back, well back to the efficacy data in animals and also to the pharmacokinetics. So just to summarize, so this is the results that we obtained. So not surprisingly, we did see uh, kind of effects in the animal models for the mechanistically well uh, connected compounds and compounds that are exposed in the animal models well. So favipiravir, molnupiravir, nimeltravir, and siltavir none of the other compounds showed any efficacy in the models. No. And this is the kind of past of generate the data from literature, gen, uh, obtain the compounds, generate the data that confirms in vitro efficacy in a relevant cell model, do the pharmacokinetics, and then do the preclinical efficacy studies. And then you can move a compound into man if you have positive data. And I think this applies for all drug purposes in general. So, mm. Yes, uh, so conclusions and key learning. So for, yeah, for repurposing, there's no model that fits all. And now I was talking about antivirals. Yeah? So other aspects, you need a different model basically, and you need to do the same type of evaluation. Is the Effects you see related to the disease, the mechanism, the exposure. So this is very important. And also, if you don't have the right animal models, this is very, very difficult to do. Yeah. And you need to secure that you have your PK, everything in place. So, and this is basically it. So if you want to be successful, think about the mechanism, think about the exposure, and you need to see a robust effect in your preclinical model. Thank you. Dr. Richard Gessner who is senior investigator on 
uh, hit 3G, H3G Drug Discovery and Development Center at the University of Cape Town uh, in South Africa. Uh, Richard joined A3G after medicinal chemistry postdoctoral fellowships at both UCT, University of Cape Town, and, and GlaxoSmithKline uh, in the UK. Since taking up the position at H3G in 2014, Richard has been responsible for overseeing tuberculosis malaria, and COVID-19 drug discovery projects that involve multidisciplinary teams. Of course, we all know the importance of having chemistry, biology, admi PK at A3G with external partners and collaborators. Uh, furthermore, he has also played a major role in implementing research project management across A3G after a sabbatical at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, ESA in 2016. So Richard, it's with great pleasure that we welcome you to Brazil, to this meeting, and uh, we have been very much inspired, I think, the endless times that Luis, myself, Adriano, and others have looked at your results in H3D in South Africa with a lot of I wouldn't say envy because it's a bad word, but uh, with a lot of admiration for the achievements that you've made there. So it's an honor for us to have you here. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you heard, my name is Richard, and I'm from Cape Town. It's the HD Center at the University of Cape Town. Just in case you're wondering where exactly that is, if you've never been to Africa before or South Africa, so this is the Cape Town city itself, and this is obviously the stadium that was built for the World Cup soccer that we held there a number of years ago, now 2010. And as you can see just down here, we are really at the bottom of the African continent. And this is the famous Table Mountain with this the CBD of Cape Town here in the middle. And the University of Cape Town is actually on the back of this slope here, which we call the Devil's Peak. This is the famous Table Mountain with the tablecloth, which is obviously the clouds. And then this is a famous mountain, which looks, if you look from the right or the left-hand side, it looks like a sleeping lion. So this here is called Lion's Head. And just behind Lion's Head, there's our fancy beaches, which bring a lot of tourists to Cape Town as well. I'm sure that also brings a lot to Brazil, although I haven't seen a beach yet since I've been here. <laughs> and then if you go directly behind this, just following the, the line the, for the bird direction that the bird would fly, this is the uh, Cape of Good Hope, the peninsula, really the Cape Point. If any of you ever in Cape Town, I'll happily take you on a drive to go see that national park at the edge of Cape Town. So enough of that. So we are a center, we are accredited center since about the year 2010 at the University of Cape Town. This is, as many of you might know, Kelly, Professor Kelly Chibali, who I did my PhD under. These are a number of scientists that we obviously have working mainly chemistry group here today with some of our entomologists. And our vision is really to be a leading uh, organization for integrated drug design and development in, on the continent of Africa, but obviously we compete with, on the international front as well. So we really, that's where the world-class, pioneering world-class drug discovery comes into play. Oh, okay, and then our mission here is to discover and develop innovating medicines uh, for infectious diseases. We build a building's Africa-specific models, so we've recently taken on a new project of understanding the microbiome as well as m metabolism of African patients, uh, really to combat overdosing, underdosing, really understanding it, all people are different on whichever continent you are, understanding the types of dosing you would need to bring into the country. And we, it's obviously a big, a big project, understanding all the different types and ethnic groups from Africa, but that we've started making a bit of a start on that. And then developing uh, drug discovery platform techniques. I'll get a bit more into that a bit later. And of course, training African scientists in drug discovery across from Africa, but we also obviously bring in international people as well for postdocs and that kind of thing as well. Okay, so today I thought I'd just give you a brief outline. There's a lot to cover, so I'll really try to be as basic and try to give you at least a flavor of what we've, where we've come from what we are looking like today and some of the key learnings we had. From hearing from Luis and uh, Helena and uh, Yardel and, and a lot of the talks, there's a lot of similarities in the challenges faced by the groups here. So it's quite refreshing to hear 
what you're going through and, and maybe we can suggest something, maybe you'll see something parallel that's happened with us and maybe we can help in that case, maybe you have a question. Obviously, I might not know all the answers, but because we have a big team, I'm only representing us today, so I could also get you in contact with whoever might be able to answer questions better as well. So just in that case, reason for existence, and then our story and some key learnings. So we're obviously very African-centric. We're looking to combat addressing unmet, unmet medical needs in the continent of Africa. That's a bit slow. Need to develop capabilities and capacities where the diseases are found, in, in, especially in Cape Town. It's one of the capitals for tuberculosis in the world, so that's why we have a lot of effort going towards tuberculosis. South Africa does have, in the northern eastern side of South Africa, we do have malaria as well, uh, plasmodium falciparum. So we are looking into malaria. That was one of our initial projects that, that got us going. And obviously more we're looking into AMR. We did have a project with COVID, which is also part of the reason I'm actually on this trip. And we look, um, and then using scientific development, and this is also for job creation. Obviously part of the big problem in, in South Africa is retaining the people that come out of the universities offering them opportunities, they either leave South Africa and go for greener pastures or they change fields completely just because of lack of chemical industry or pharmaceutical injury in South Africa. So our story, so this was HUD in 2009 and before that it was basically just a medicinal chemistry lab. I am a chemist as well by, by uh, study. I did my PhD and I, up until 2008. And so we were basically a chemistry lab, but we, we found a partner that really got us the ball rolling for H3D with a partnership with MMV, uh, Malaria for Medicines Venture. And at that stage, you can see here, we just were a lab and we would outsource all the biology to Swiss TPH where they would do all the ma malaria parasite screening, um, any SCID model or any in vivo model for malaria. And also all the pharmacology in those days, we also sourced out to the CDCO in Australia as well as uh, work at, well, all through other partners of MMV as well. And this really, there were about six chemists back in the days for that. It's taking a little bit of time. And this actually led to our finding of the first preclinical candidate for malaria, which came from Africa. I won't spend too much time going through it, but we do just call the acronym of 0048, which is this amino pyridine uh, compound up over here. What was so great or initially great about this compound is that it, it was, could be dosed at a single cure. It had a long half-life of almost two days or something like that. So you would only need to dose it once to obviously get that therapeutic amount needed to treat it. But at the same time, that also has the potential for having a drug around in your system for a long period of time, which then could also result in toxic, toxicology and uh, cytotoxicity complications as well. Um, it did, it, there was no evidence at that stage for anything for cross resistance. Um, it, what was also great about it is that it hit the malaria life cycle at multiple different stages. So it was also a transmission blocker as well as a, a prophylaxis or a cure for malaria as a treatment. Um, and, it, and later it was identified to be the target of it was this PI4K uh, kinase um, target of, uh, of the malaria falciparum. In 2014-15, we did the first phase one, first in man clinical trials at the University of Cape Town. And then later in 2017, we finished phase 2A clinical trials in Ethiopia. Um, this, the progress of the molecule, unfortunately, has stopped at this stage due to toxicology complications, especially with targeting PI4K. Um, but we do have a promising backup now, which we call UCT943. And, the, and currently we're busy doing preclinical talks for those compounds. So after that, obviously that also brought us a lot of recognition in terms of the international environment with a preclinical candidate coming from Africa. And in about 2013-14, we joined the TBDA consortium, which is a Bill and Melinda Gates TB uh, consortium, which is a whole host of industrial partners, other academic uh, institutions, um, philanthropic institutions, and really it's about bringing, and what I see a lot of it here, here as well from the previous talks, is basically the networking of teams coming together. Obviously there's limited resources available in terms of money, uh, exper the expertise, the, the, the students to do it, or, or the people to do it. And so this is really about, with that limited amount of money that comes into it, how do, we, how do the teams make the best use of it to not duplicate efforts in any kind of 
effort in that. So you could come into this consortium with a target, you'd find out quite quickly if another team within the consortium is working in that area or have worked. You can share the experience, you can share the project, share the risk, move forward with the project with experience and multiple partners. And obviously the pharmaceutical players in that also offer the potential as a clinical uh, partner for development at later if it's needed. And also you have the option of the opportunity to make use of certain assays being available through the network as well. And so that was a, obviously a big build for us, especially on the TB platform. And then even more recently in the last two years, it, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates has started what they call MOLDA, which is the malaria drug accelerator. And it basically follows the same principles of teams working together, uh, joining up with uh, pharmaceutical industry, philanthropical teams, as well as other research institutes to do a similar thing as they did for TB with the malaria and really just focus that r limited resources to development of potential candidates for TB and malaria. <clears throat> More, most recently in the last year, we've actually become a satellite center for J&J, &J, and this was because we've recently moved in to do a AMR research, um, hit to lead projects. So there are three centers around the world, one at the London School of Health Hygiene, I think, in London, and then Singapore, and so we are the third center now. And basically, they are funding uh, AMR research. We have about four, about four to six uh, postdocs, but they're obviously employed at an investigator level. And they, we benefit from having scientific and translational expertise from J&J. &J. We provide the platform, the, the infrastructure to do the research. And then other contributors is obviously academic partners and funding agencies. So it really brought us into the AMR space. Let's, let's see what happens in the next couple of years. But I know that we've just recently found some new hits to start some hit to lead programs as well. Okay, so this is our current platform at the moment. I won't go into too much detail, but you can see our malaria being our first project. We have quite a lot of engagement in various levels of projects from formal head assessment or biology triaging to hit to lead to lead up to the preclinical development. And then in the TB, obviously it's, it's quite a tough area for those who've worked in TB. I'm not too sure how many of you have, but we've got quite a, we, over the years, we've been pretty much stuck in the formal head assessment, hit to lead, and had about one or two hit, uh, lead up projects. It's quite a bit different space in the malaria programs. And then this is the recent AMR program that we're doing. I'll, sp I'll quickly speak on one slide on this, is that we've recently started working into scale up or method development for antiretrovirals, just to rather than importing all the drugs into Africa, starting to do some uh, commercialization and, and scale up, or at least method de development for scale up of drugs that are needed for African diseases, in this case, HIV. And then we've also got our technology platforms, and then as well, Kelly Chibali still has his academic group where he's able to, where, where projects that fail in HDD or we just don't have the time, we have to give it a no-go, they can be taken up by a, an academic pers a person as a potential master's or PhD project. If the project is successful, obviously they get the opportunity for, for publication, but then it can come back into HDD again and become a, a full-blown project within HDD as well. Um, so this is us today. So as you remember, we were just a medicinal lab 10 years ago. And so we brought on uh, CAD, obviously computer-aided drug discovery, AI and machine learning tools now, especially being applied to our malaria projects at this stage. We were able to bring in the platforms of ADMI where we have all the different ADMI uh, profiling assays that we require. We have in vivo models, mouse, rat, hamster capabilities. Uh, one of the first setup in terms of biology we did was more for in, in vitro and vivo modeling for malaria. So we have the skid mouse model as well, the humanized mouse model. We have the biology modeling, uh, biology, uh, TV biology, which is, they actually do quite a lot of mutant generation. So we have a lot of more deconvolution of mechanism of action over here. So not so much malaria, but more in the TB. And now we're developing the AMR biology as well, where we can also try identify what the targets are for specific kits as well. And at the same time, we're developing an enzymology platform, and we do have cytotoxicity screening against a host of different mammalian cell lines, CHO, VERO, um, L6, a couple of them now. And then another thing, as we've grown, we've obviously needed data storage and sample management teams as well. And as you heard, i had been at uh, Novartis to bring in project management. So as the team has grown, we've obviously recognized that we, there were certain things that we needed to employ. This is just our current pipeline. I won't spend too much. We, as you can see, our malaria program has got a few much more advanced programs than the rest of the, 
the platforms. We have a number of TB projects over here, with, which are mainly within the TBDA. As you can see, we've also moved to transition more to using target-based drug design than just doing phenotypic screening, which is where we originally were started. Um, we also, in AMR, there's been a lot of triaging. We have brought on one project over here. And then just one, I just wanted to highlight the reason that we were here today was because of our BRICS collaboration with um, Carolina and Christy, team from uh, USP and UFG. And so we're actually attending Braz Medchem next week because of that. And I just also I forgot to thank Luis and Jaro and Luisa and Rachel for for all the uh, hospitality and for inviting us to attend this and share a little bit of a story with you today. I just wanted to say there's one thing that we've also brought on board is which we call the HCD Foundation. So this is really about, we're trying to figure out how to address if you get a, a compound um, that progresses to the clinic, how do we find a partner, how do we establish the funding, because that's very expensive to move into the clinic. And so the HUD Foundation is a, separate, a slightly separate entity to HUD, and they are really involved with going about fundraising. They are looking for potential partners and collaborators and seeing how we could progress things further. Another th thing that they brought on board is that we're looking to enable drug discovery across Africa. And I just wanted to do one slide over here where we're working quite closely with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation where they will provide us with uh, some money, not for us, but then we will open up applications for other groups across Africa where they can apply to us. We will go through the projects and potentially offer them a seed funding project to at least try conceptualize, get an idea of moving that project forward where then they can look for a partnership or collaboration with us at a later stage or that project goes nowhere, but at least they have the opportunity to have the money to get somewhere. And through that, you can just see some of the photos of some of the other universities in South Africa that we're working with, as well as um, uh, setting up a center in Ghana. And then I'll go very quickly. I think I've got like zero minutes left. Um, so what we're trying to do is offer, obviously through the drug discovery platform, we will then offer the platforms and services as cost for the other African units to be able to do the work and screening that they need to do if they, they don't have the capability. It can even be as much as offering them NMR, just doing an NMR for them, which they, most of them don't even have that, that, that instrumentation available to them. And then they also can, in other ways, if they're looking at other disease areas, we can also offer them our HD library to screen against that specific target or specific uh, uh, disease area that they are looking to investigate with, and potentially we can find hits. Um, we also offer a mentorship program where Bill and Melinda Gates has actually offered us a bit of money where we can take scientists and look for industrial partners internationally to become mentors for various people within our team to, to develop them in terms of scientific. We know that we don't have all the expertise in South Africa, so bringing in people from the international scene is very important to the growing and, and growth of the various scientists. Um, there's various workshops and webinars that we've started offering. Um, DDU does a very similar thing. In some cases, we do some combined courses and webinars with DDU. Um, there's also opportunity for sabbaticals. You just spoke of um, Jeremy Burrows uh, in, from MMV. His son just came to do a sabbatical in our labs for the last few weeks. Um, he's also a chemist, surprise. And, Obviously, we can also offer them project management support for the various projects that they have or bring to, into the, um, bring to us at, in Cape Town. And then obviously through the networks that we've already established, they have opportunity to also potentially meet up and, and look for collaborations and partners within the international scene as well. Um, I think I've got one or two more slides. I can get it to change. Oh. And then this was just the last thing that I did touch on, is that we, through funding from US, USAID, we've been looking into uh, uh, flow technology, where we've brought on six new postdocs from around South Africa and Africa, where they'll get training in the US on flow, uh, 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 what's it? the flow technology needed for scale up of synthesis. What they'll be doing, we, we're currently renovating a lab in Cape Town where they will uh, with our optimized conditions to do scale up and then through our partner at CPT Pharma we'll then, they will then license the ability and, and the optimized conditions that we use that we develop for the scale up and then they'll use that to synthesize large scale quantities of compound and that's really to supply and we've identified these three antiretrovirals over here which then can be used in, internally without having to import these drugs. 
Um, last thing, just the key learning slide. I'll be very quick with this. So these are some of the things that might be quite of more interest to you. If you want to ask me about any of them, I'll try to give you the best answer. But these are really things that we've learned over the time. And maybe you can even, you, you, it's very similar for yourself as well, and you identify with it. So really, we had to have humility. We had to know what we knew, and we had to know what we didn't know from the start. We couldn't pretend that we could do everything in the beginning, and we had to identify the areas that we, could, that we needed to strengthen, and that was really then looking for the, the, the right partners to develop in those specific areas. We needed a clear vision. We needed to be very focused on what disease areas we would focus on. So as I did say, malaria and TB, and now AMR. We did look at COVID for a bit, but. Uh, our group is not that big. We're about 70 people currently, and, that's, and we have biology, chemistry, CAD, <laughs> support, and all that kind of thing. So we can't do four disease platforms, and that's unfortunately why we're not really pushing forward at the moment with the COVID or antiviral space. But potentially in the future, it's something we will look at again. And then, obviously, what we were able to do from the start was that we leveraged any philanthropic funding, which was mainly from Gates and MMV at the time, and we needed the government to support it. We needed, so whatever money came in from international, we had to get the local government to agree to match that money. It was an agreement also with the gates. So if they invested X, X amount of money, the government would have to take the same risk and potential for rewards as well. So it was a, a partnership from the start within the funder as well as the, the government or the yeah, of South Africa. Um, we also, we also heard of Sir Simon Campbell a bit earlier. So when we formed, we also had a very uh, um, experienced scientific management board that would, we would have to present our projects to every quarter. And that was really made up of various well-established scientists. And they, they wouldn't make our decisions for us, but they would really try to guide us into making the correct no-go decisions. Uh, if we wanted to make a no-go, they could challenge you and say, have you tried this, have you tried that in terms of chemistry or biology or whatever assays we wanted to do. And so Simon initially was on our scientific advisory board, but we also have the likes of Dennis Smith from, who was ex-Pfizer. Uh, we currently have, um, well, I won't go, we have Paul Herling from Novartis as well, from who used to do neck nectar diseases. Okay, and then we've obviously got this collaboration now uh, with the big pharma that I mentioned. Uh, obviously we're leveraging uh, through NGOs as well as the university investment in drug discovery leadership. Okay. And so that's really just investing in the future and the sciences, giving them the opportunity to go to sabbaticals. I did mention I got the opportunity to go to Novartis for training as well. And then the HR project is another whole story. We're in the university environment. We needed a system of HR that matches a pharmaceutical level and not an academic model. So that's also had to be developed. And then lastly, we just had to be unrelenting consistency with our decisions and, and the way we wanted to move forward. I just want to thank all our funders that we've had up into to this time, including a lot of the South African funders over here, the MRC. We are, just one of the last thing I want to say is we are a, a, a TIA-funded platform. So any assay that we offer in South Africa is available to any other research team. We are funded by the government to do any ADMI cytotoxicity assays for teams at cost. And so if, if another team needs a model or an assay, we get funded to do those kind of things. And this is our team in the botanical gardens by the Table Mountain. And I wanted to quickly advertise a pitch. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really over time. That we're going to be having a symposium next year at the uh, Zambezi at the Victoria Falls in, between, in Zambia, between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And these are a number of speakers. It's infectious disease. If you want any more details, you can just come to me or drop me an email. I can put you, lead you in the right direction, offer you. This will be happening next year in May. And if you'd like to follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn, please, please do. Thank you. Dr. Amaury Jardim de Paula, uh, uh, who is leading, together with some other colleagues, a new experiment in the uh, qualification of human resources 
at the undergraduate level uh, in a multidisciplinary approach, uh, very, very prone to uh, what is needed in the area of drug discovery. So, Amaury, thank you. Amaury is a professor at the Department of Physics in the Federal University of Ceará and the coordinator of laboratories and research at ILUM School of Science in the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials, where the synchrotron is based here in Campinas. He holds a, a bachelor's in chemistry uh, from UNESP Araraquara and uh, a PhD uh, from uh, the State University of Campinas, Unicampi here, and was a visiting professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He has experience in thermodynamics, colloids, optical and electron microscopy, image processing, machine learning, and natural language processing. Amaury, you have the floor. Thank you. And I have to say that talks are supposed to be 15 minutes each. Okay, 15 minutes. Okay, so thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, can I can I walk through? To, uh, ah, here. Thank you. Okay. Oh, very nice. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So my talk here today will be about um, the possible training, the preparation of a new generation of scientists in Brazil, in our country here. So the this talk is related with the 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 settlement, the establishment of a new school here in Campinas. Uh, I know some, some of you uh, are aware of it. So it's ILU, Escola de Ciencias. Uh, it's a school that is, is part of CNIPEN. CNIPEN is the Brazilian, uh, the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. So the, the, the center is divided in four laboratories, four large laboratories. So the first one here I would like to, to say is Synchrotron Laboratory. is the, um, the laboratory responsible for managing Sirius, which is our fourth generation uh, Synchrotron light source. One of the few in operation in the world. I think, I think we have four or five of them. Uh, so, we have another laboratory dedicated to study of nanotechnologies, uh, another one of biosciences and the bio-renewables. Uh, we have, also we have a, a, a very large division of engineering who helps to keep everything working, of course. We have a lot of advanced uh, high-tech uh, equipment and uh, structures, so. So the, the school, Elon, is a very small addition to the center, if you consider all of this, uh, the current configuration of the center. We are very small. We are just uh, uh, 13 professors, uh, a little bit of support technicians. Uh, uh, but it was a very important uh, addition, I, I may say. So. Uh, so we are very close to Unicamp. We are not at the CNIPEN campus. So the campus, at least currently, at least uh, we have the plan to go to the campus one day. But uh, currently, we are, so he, we are here at Unicamp. Uh, I think it. Uh, can you hear well? The microphone is is it's okay. No problem. So if we cross. Dom Pedro Highway here, we reach this neighborhood, the Fazenda Santa Cândida. This is the building uh, in which the, the school is being held today. This is our front, the, the design of our, the front of the building. And this building has a very important uh, historical context to Brazilian science. So, uh, in this building, it was a warehouse in which we had the um, the production of the first line electron linear accelerator in Brazil. So LINAC, LINAC was the name. So this is the inauguration of LINAC at, 20, at 1990. And after this, the LINAC was transferred to the current campus of Senipain and it was a part of our first synchrotron uh, light source that operated for decades in Brazil. One of the first, I think, the if I remember correctly, it was the first in Southern Hemisphere. Uh, so it was a very important building and the building was completely remodeled, a very nice work, uh, and uh, became what we have today as this school. So, 
Uh, I need to highlight here also the inspiration behind this school. So Professor Rogério Cerqueira Leite is the current president of the board of directors of CNP. He's an emeritus professor here at Unicamp, a, a very a key person in the physics community of Brazil. He was a previous uh, director of Bell Labs in the United States, so it's a very important uh, person for Brazilian science. And um, he was uneasy about the way uh, young students were being prepared in, in our country um, to be scientists, or at least to be researchers, right? So I, I quote here uh, a sentence, uh, a phrase that he, he used to say, uh, he would like to know a biologist that uh, have a that, that has a, a deep knowledge in mathematics or physics or chemistry. So this was the idea. This is what he was uneasy about. So, and the school uh, was was created in this context here. So. Uh, I, I, I bring here another quote from, from Popper that I think it summarized pretty well uh, the essence of, our, of, of Elon, the essence of our school. So uh, we are trying to provide to the students uh, experiences uh, through which they, they can acquire competence to deal with complex problems such as those that we have today that are very difficult to tackle uh, just with, in a disciplinary way, just with some uh, uh, unique uh, approach. So we need a uh, we need a, a greater convergence between all of these areas here. So the course that the, the the program that we are offering in this school is a program. It's a bachelor degree in science and technology, uh, what we call BCT, right? So the program uh, essentially it converges all of these areas in. Uh, in, in six semesters, three years minimum to conclude, uh, we have a very di disruptive uh, way of teaching, a very disruptive teaching methodologies in this school. Uh, since its creation, we thought that uh, we, we should change the way we would uh, teach the students. So we did everything based on active learning and uh, the courses that are offered they highly interconnect all these the, these areas: mathematics, physics, chemistry, data science. We also have a part of humanities, which was a demand from Professor uh, Rogério. It was very uh, <laughs> he was very uh, certain about this that we should include uh, humanities in the in the in the program. Uh, so here I bring you a picture of our last class, the class of. 2025. It was admitted. It was admitted this year. So here in the middle of the photograph, uh, it's Professor Adalberto Fazio. He's our current director. Uh, he's a very also a physicist, a very important one for for Brazilian community, um, uh, especially in the last decades. And he was the responsible essentially to convert all that inspiration from Professor Rogério and others to a real thing, to a concrete thing. That is what we have today uh, working, right? So he was very important because it's not easy <laughs> to convert those ideas in, in a concrete, in a school that, as we have today. So he's, he, he was responsible for it. For the, for the, uh, so uh, just uh, an overview about uh, our last admissions. So, the last class, uh, we had more than a thousand applications. Uh, here is the distribution of the students coming from different regions, geographic regions of Brazil. Uh, we have a good participation here from Northeast. Uh, the school is being funded by the Ministry of Education, so it's a, we can say that it's, a, it's, a, it's not a federal institution because it's a, a, a social organization, it's a different type of administration that we have in the school, it's a social administration. Uh, so we have federal funding, right? So we expect to have, a, a, of course, a, a participation, uh, admissions from every region of the country, and this is what we are aiming to, to increase even more. So, uh, so we have a gender distribution here, and this is important. We have 50% of the admissions, they are guaranteed to study, to 
students for, from the, the public system of Brazil, right? At, at least 50%. But, so we are very close to this number, uh, starting from the admissions. We already have a, a, a greater interest from students coming from the public school. So this is what we are, we are realizing. So it's also interesting to say that the applications at the admission rate, it's about 25%. This is, this is a pretty high number if we consider some similar programs like Bachelor in Physics and Chemistry in Brazil, even Biology. So we are, we're, uh, this is a high number here. I'll be quick here. Uh, so this is the, the, the faculty members. We have a group of young professors, uh, chemists, physicists, biologists. We have an engineer here. An engineer here. So we have also three seniors professor. They are three of them. They are all from Unicamp. One of them is a, an emeritus one, Professor Martinez. Uh, professor Hernandez is still active here, and Luis Marquez is retired from Unicamp. And we have these two coordinators here. It's Professor Nelson and and, and myself. Um, go. It's stuck. So. Uh, just quick here. So essentially, we, wa we, we are providing to the students uh, experiences in, in, in which they will develop research activities. Uh, and we can group all of these experiences, we are grouping them all of in two main areas here. Uh, so the students, they deal with topics in matter, in matter science and also in uh, life and environmental science. So, and also to support all of these experiences that they do, we have uh, courses being provided on thermodynamics, dynamics, quantum mechanics, and genetics, and so on. A lot of courses here, theoretical courses. Uh, one of the differentials, sorry, so one of the big differentials that we have is the, of course, the, the proximity, the, the being a part of Sany Pains is, is a big deal, right? So all, all, all the students, all of them, they go through research activities in Sany Pains. Uh, developing research projects in collaboration with uh, the researchers from CNP, and they walk through this path, this pathway here, uh, crossing all of these areas uh, uh, in each semester. So first, second, third, fourth, uh, fifth, and, and then the, the last semester they chose a topic and a, pro a research project to to develop in CNP, uh using all of the infrastructure, all the facilities. So. Um, so here, here there are some examples here of some of the projects just to exemplify. Yeah, they, they go from the production of electronic quantum devices to uh, calculating modeling protein folding, uh, like uh, using uh, machine learning models like alpha folding and uh, etc. So. Uh, quick, uh, let's go. Another thing that I'd like to highlight here is we also have a very uh, good base in terms of in, in tools of uh, tools of data science so uh, the students they also go through this path here that from an introduction to data science to python uh, some topics here going through machine learning neural networks and they go up to advanced techniques like na uh, natural language process all of these the students they deal with in especially in the model of project based learning and we, we a very good uh, base in data science. This is also very it's a differential that we have in the school today. So some pictures uh, with the remodeling of the of the warehouse. The the, the inner environment become became very uh, very very good, uh, very very nice. Uh, thank you. So here we have so we have our living areas here. Uh, so look at our classrooms, they are different, it's because even our furniture, uh, it was think it was thought to support the, the teaching methodologies, uh, all of is it in uh, active learning, so uh, all of the classes, they are very collaborative, uh, you, we always use uh, the tables, discussions, also we provide every student uh, when they do the enrollment in the school, uh, they, they get a computer, a laptop, to, to develop all the activities along the course, uh, along the, the program. So also we have a very good lab structure uh, with spectros, spectrometers, with microscopes, uh, uh, prototyping lab, it's very complete. 
we also have a studio in which the students use to record videos, to stream online, uh, podcasts, and so on. So I think I finished yet. Yeah, thank you. I was informed that we have to have a, a small alteration in the program now uh, because we will have a, a, a video of a, a, a contribution of a very important uh, uh, component on this program. Uh, Dr. Carla Reis de Souza Neto, she's from the National Development Bank, BNDS, uh, who is a very important partner of the NDI in the Lola program. So they've been funding some of the activities of the Lola program. And uh, uh, it was, I mean, very important to have this uh, contribution from, from them to express what they, they are feeling about this, this collaboration. Uh, Dr. Carla Hayes couldn't be here in person today, so she recorded a, a small video and, and she'll be uh, which will be presented now. She's the head of the Department of the Economics and Industrial Complex in the health area, area of BNDS. So, I don't know who is going to have the video there, ready for presentation. Oh, there it is. My name is Carla Reis and I'm head of the health department at BNDS, the Brazilian Development Bank. First, I would like to congratulate Lola on its 10th anniversary and thank the NDI for inviting me to this relevant event. I'd like to apologize for my physical absence today due to conflicting events and expect to contribute to the debate on financial mechanisms to foster innovation in treatments and prevention of neglected diseases. The NDS role in especially the NDS role in health, and especially in pharma, is to provide funding aiming to simultaneously improve industry competitiveness and access to quality medicines. On the competitiveness side, increased scale and scope of private innovation efforts is paramount. On the access side, we co-evolved together with companies, scientific institutions and other government policies on the path from GMP, facilities, generics, incremental innovation and biosimilars towards radical innovation. Brazil's new industrial policy adopted a mission-oriented approach, stating that a resilient health industry would be the basis for mitigating the vulnerability of the Brazilian unified health system, the SUS, in expanding access to health. Among its specific objectives, the policy stated endemic and neglected diseases as a key focus on for research, development, innovation and production. Despite the challenge of promoting industry innovation through credit, BINDES' main product, encouraging R&D in the area of neglected diseases is even more difficult and requires other instruments. BNDS funding for grants does not come from federal government budget, but actually from the profits these loans generate, which makes it even more scarce. On 2015, we signed a 15, a 15 million reais grant contract with Osvaldo Cruz Foundation in partnership with the NDI to develop six projects that addresses multiple challenges on leishmaniosis, pediatric AIDS, tuberculosis, Hansen's disease, and trachoma. Due to many challenges, four of these six projects are concluded. The other two projects are planned to finish by the end of 2024. For the future, BNDS changed its strategy for grants. To reduce internal bureaucracy and give projects the flexibility R&D and innovation require, we signed a partnership with Embra-P, the Brazilian company of research and industrial innovation. For healthcare, we focus on strategic technologies for the Brazilian Unified Health System, SUS, with a 20 million reais budget. By now, there are nine science and technology institutions approved to receive these grants. 
awaiting the signature by counterparts and projects. Their capabilities range from biotech, diagnose, diagnosis, uh, information and communication technologies, dr to drug discovery, optimization, preclinical and clinical studies. More information can be, can be found at Embrapi's website at uh, www.embrapi.org.br. You have to search for BNDS partnership, Parceria BNDS. I wish you all a productive meeting and Lola and the NDI success in its important mission. Thank you. Very good. So we can now continue with our uh, original program, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the next talk, which will be given by Dr. Nils Olsen Kamera, an old friend from the University of São Paulo. Nils is now a close advisor to the FAPESP Scientific Director and Scientific Board, and uh, uh, is full professor at the Immunology Department of the Biomedical Sciences Institute of University of Sao Paulo, he's, where he's head of the Transplant Immunobiology Laboratory that investigates the role of the immune uh, response in the development and resolution of inflammatory processes in chronic non-communicable diseases. But in this meeting, he will be with the hat of FAPESP, uh, the major partner of DNDI in the uh, LOLA program here at Unicampi. So, Nils, take the floor. Yeah, okay, so thank you very much, Klaus and Luis, for this invitation. Indeed, I'm here on behalf of Professor Márcio de Castro, the new scientific director of FAPESP. So the idea is to present three things. I will introduce a little bit for those who are very young and here, just talk about FAPESP. And then I will explain a little bit uh, what we feel that's going on on research right now in Brazil. And I'm happy that I see the president of the Brazilian Academy of Science, so she will uh, contribute on this. And the final part of this presentation is how FAPESP is actually think about this. Since we begin this new term at FAPESP, you have to think in a new way to do research, how we will support uh, uh, the labs and the students in so as Glaucio said, so FAPESP is the biggest state university in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, uh, we support um, uh, research in the entire state. There are some exceptions. We have a very good uh, uh, partnership with the Ministry of Science, Science and Technology and Innovation. So we have ways to support research outside Sao Paulo. But specifically what we are doing here uh, is how to do research in this state. São Paulo for Richard is here, so it's one of the richest states uh, in the country. Uh, we used to say that uh, we looks like Spain, uh, we have a land area of UK, but our GDP is close to uh, Sweden. So, São Paulo is responsible for more or less, oh gosh, 35% uh, of the research that is doing the whole country, so it's very important, representative uh, of the power of, of the state. Uh, as you know, FAPESP uh, receive uh, a specific amount of money from the state of Sao Paulo, this is in the constitution, this is very important as compared to the other uh, founding agency, and they have to spend the whole amount in research. We don't pay salary, but we pay and support students and uh, 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 re uh, bench work research uh, in the labs. We can do this in a continuous way, but we can also open some calls specifically in one area, and this is done during the whole year uh, 
uh, uh, the whole year. We normally have a way to, to analyze the, the proposal. So all proposals are assessed at least for two uh, uh, external advisors. At the end, we made a, a decision and it can, we can support. So if you compare, if you look uh, in a specific way using this pair power uh, analysis, the PPP, SOPESP spent in the last two years 700 million. Uh, uh, and this is basically, as I said, in basic and applied research, but also in the uh, in FAPESP uh, statement, they have to spend some uh, 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 funding for strategic research communication, this is a very new way how FAPESP can actually help to disseminate uh, their products to society. Also research innovation, this is very strong and probably will increase in the upcoming years. And we have a very strong also uh, program for infrastructure. You know that we just released uh, the, uh, the last result on that. Uh, if you look to all areas of knowledge, uh, life science, is actually the, the area that received most uh, part of the research from FAPESP, but FAPESP funds any research in all areas of knowledge, okay? Uh, if you look uh, how FAPESP is actually connected to the sustainable development goals, so you can see that more or less in all of them we have a participation, some of them uh, are stronger than the other one. What is very interesting is that some uh, areas that it doesn't seem to be so uh, um, strong when you look to the impact of this research is actually very high. So you don't receive the largest amount of money, but what we are fund funding is very important to have a big social and economic impact on society. So this is very important. But we have to discuss uh, what we are just facing right now in the context of um, not only Brazil, but in the world. So this is a new area post-pandemic, and we have to learn uh, a lot since we spent two years just struggling and uh, uh, fighting against several um, actors, not only the virus. So um, we, we know that science was under major attack, and this is, was very important that we need to survive and fight back and show that what we are doing in the labs uh, and the university was very important to uh, face and to overcome the pandemics. But as a consequence of that, uh, we realized that actually, actually Brazil was uh, among the 20 countries that decreased the total amount of publication in this uh, uh, post-pandemic in these two years. So in, in Brazil, the average was 7.2% of less uh, uh, publications. And this was in contrast to this a uh, very nice uh, line that we are every year just uh, increasing the amount of the papers and contribute to this world research. And this was in all areas of, of knowledge. So you can see a drop here uh, uh, in all areas of knowledge. So this just uh, turn on uh, red lights and you have to be aware of what's going on. Of course, the pandemic uh, has a major effect, but we believe that some other aspects pre-pandemic also contribute to this scenario. So in the, on the other uh, part of this talk, what is very uh, important, and uh, uh, this was in a Marie uh, uh, presentation, we don't know how much this is important, but we see the discussion in some journals, Nature Science, about the decrease in disruptive science. So for PESP needs to be aware of that and needs to discuss with the scientific community how important this is. Are we just supporting this uh, science that it's not actually changing anything, just corroborating what was uh, published before? Uh, and this is a major point I have to give uh, to, to earn some minutes just because of this. Okay, so okay, so uh, as I said, we don't know uh, how important it is, but it's a fact that the number of disruptive papers has declined over the years, and not only uh, in Brazil but uh, worldwide. Also, uh, if you look to the amount of uh, PhD uh, students that are actually awarded in Brazil. 
as compared to other countries, we still don't um, award them. Or we don't uh, have enough uh, PhD students uh, as we need uh, as a, a country. And this is also uh, a major problem because uh, it's becoming less attractive to have students in the lab, not only because the salary is very low, recently increased, but it's still very low, uh, uh, high cost to live in some cities like Sao Paulo. Uh, I assume that uh, Unicamp is also, uh, Campinas is also very expensive, but uh, this decrease uh, is very important because in Brazil, the major uh, research is actually done by PhD and master students. We don't have a whole lot of postdoc as the US and Europe just to take in charge uh, uh, science. And also, this is very uh, important. Here in Sao Paulo, uh, we are just accepting students older and older to get into the uh, 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 PhD program. So um, this is uh, a major issue also for us. So we know that it's no longer attractive. We see the decrease uh, in the number of the students. We, before uh, working in FAPESP, we work at the graduate office at the University of Sao Paulo, and we were following this number for more than two or five years, and the numbers is going down and down and down. And not us, was only due to the pandemics, was pre pandemics. So this is a major issue and FAPESP needs to be aware. So how we can, how we, we face this uh, new scenario that uh, was actually aggravated by the pandemics. I think the way is what Luis wants us to discuss is about innovation. We have to think outside the box, think in ways that we should make uh, uh, research more collaborative, more connected to what the society needs from us, fast in a way to respond uh, uh, to a challenge as we did uh, uh, um, during the pandemics and that's why they won the Nobel Prize this year. But this is just an example and I'm sorry I took an example from the universe where I'm working. So uh, during the pandemics uh, some scientists from the engineer they come up with a very low cost uh, ventilators. Also we have this way to to test for COVID. If you remember the beginning of the pandemics, we ran out of tests and this was a major problem because we could not actually uh, deal with so many positive uh, uh, contamination. So this is innovation. Innovation was done uh, absolutely, uh, wow. This is fast track innovation. Uh, so if you could come back again. So the idea is if we manage to do this in a very short way, uh, uh, there was actually triggered by the, uh, the pandemic. So a little, so you can come back. We can still carry on uh, in doing this uh, in a more collaborative way. And I think he should said in the beginning of uh, his talk. Uh, and this is uh, the way we can actually overcome all this problem. To do this kind of research is actually more expensive than the individual research. We need to be connected. We need to find ways to find the right collaborator for this, uh, collab uh, this research. But this is what we are discussing at the moment and we'll actually come by uh, with some good ideas. But I have to give some example of what is already going on at FAPESP. And FAPESP has very, very interesting programs that uh, stays there for the last tw uh, 10, 15 years. And it was all about innovation and sustainability. Uh, this was the climate change program that was very, very productive and open many fields uh, uh, in research. We just have now what we call Amazon Initiative. This begins with uh, nine states in the Amazonia area plus Sao Paulo, but now we are 25 uh, different states with uh, funding agency that we can do uh, collaborative research to actually develop the Amazonia, not our labs, but their labs and contribute to their uh, uh, research. And also we are just trying to update the BioN program. This is a very old program, very important to the uh, uh, renewable energy that in the state of Sao Paulo was pioneer in studying several ways to, 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 to think uh, uh, in different 
uh, types of energy. So this was already done by FAPESP and a long time ago, a long time before this discussion actually was on the table. So if you need to face this challenge, you have at least to do this kind of research trying to find a, a, a nice collaboration to have funding, and FAPESP can do this, they have funding and exactly uh, to support this kind of uh, uh, research. They need to have a political will, and I, I believe that from our part is already there, but we need uh, the university and also the uh, state of Sao Paulo to be on. Uh, just to give also another idea, part of the funding from FAPESP is to support companies that we call uh, 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 how can startups and uh, some companies can actually do research together with or not with a university. So they have several programs that we call PIP is one of them, but just in this year uh, we managed to do several ways to support these companies. This is uh, just uh, uh, an angel, so this is like an angel investor, so you can find someone to help you to, uh, to find fundings. This is also support by FAFESP, together with FINEP we have the Centelia, so if you go online on FAPESP website, you can find several different uh, ways to, to be supported uh, and to do innovation uh, if you have a good idea that will become a product later on. So my final slide is just if you want to face another problem like the pandemic, we need to be creative. We need to see uh, science in a different way and don't be... Uh, 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 you, you have to overcome problems uh, uh, in a, in a, using our creativity uh, 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 in a different way to see a, a, a problem. I think this kind of curiosity is the answer for, for this question. So thank you very much. If you want, you can send us some email. I'll be happy to, to answer that. So our last speaker is from the Ministry of Science and Technology and Innovation. Uh, a, as, you, as you know, here in Brazil, perhaps for our, our partners from abroad, uh, we have a, a ministry dedicated to science, technology and innovation. Uh, although there are departments of science and technology and innovation in many other, in many other ministries as well, but uh, the ministry has a very, very central role in, in the planning and funding for science in, 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 in Brazil in general. So uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Thais Alini Vaz Souza. Uh, she is the uh, joint director or coordinator uh, of programs and projects for health, biotechnology and agriculture of the Ministry of Science and Technology. She is a biologist with PhD in genetics and molecular biology from Unicampi here and is uh, at MCTI at the ministry since 2010. Uh, uh, from 2019 she joined the Health, Biotechnology and Agricultural Sciences section of the Ministry uh, and her major responsibilities are related to the creation and execution of public policies in science and technology and promotion of research development and innovation activities in health and biotechnology as well as the establishment of institutional and international cooperation agreements. Uh, so it's my pleasure to have uh, Thais here. Please join us for your talk. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank you for the introduction and the organizers by, by the invitation to be here with you today to talk about the MCTI's strategies for health and neglected tropical diseases, NTDs. 
Uh, I would like first to highlight that the MCTI's priorities in research, development and innovation are established at the National Strategy for Science, Technology and Innovation. We are currently using this strategy designed to cover the peri period of 2016 to 2022, but a new one is under development and should be made public after the next National Conference on Science, Technology and Innovation to be held in July 2024. The National Strategy for Science, Technology and Innovation is divided into several action plans which presents the priority thematic lines in different areas of knowledge. Although there is no specific thematic line for NTDs, the action plans in science, technology and innovation in biotechnology and in, in health include thematic lines that can support actions to combat NTDs among other threats to Brazilian public health. Those lines include the prevention, control, diagnosis and treatment of emerging and re-emerging communicable diseases, preclinical trials, clinical trials and the development of health supplies. And it's not possible to talk about the health area at MCTI without mentioning the creation of the MCTI virus network, which is uh, known as Red Virus MCTI. Uh, the network was created in March 2020 as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's a scientific advisory forum that supports MCTI in the promoting uh, the integration of scientific research and technological de development efforts in emerging and re-emerging viruses and in the defining of research priorities in this area of knowledge. Within the scope of the Rede Virus MCTI, uh, there was uh, the creation of three sub-networks. Uh, Previr Network, which detects and analyzes viruses with emergency potential from wild animals to people. The Hemonar Network, which performs the monitoring of wastewater and surface water as an alternative early detection method for viral outbreaks. And the Coronaomics Networks, which carries out genomic sequencing and transcriptomic studies to monitor the evolution of the virus as well as the characteristics linked to the severity of the infection. And although these networks were created to face the coronavirus, their role can be expanded to any other for clinical trials. Within the scope of this initiative, there is a public call under development for active pharmaceutical ingredients development and its scaling up, and for the conduction of preclinical trials of medicines. For this call, one of the criteria to be evaluated should be the focus on neglected diseases. An important intersectoral initiative coordinated by the Ministry of Health is CIEDS, the Interministerial Committee for the Elimination of Tuberculosis and Other Socially Determined Diseases. These diseases have a direct relationship with the social, economic and environmental conditions in which people live, and many of them are neglected tropical diseases. CIEDS re reinforces the Brazilian government's commitment to ending some diseases and infections that are determined by and also perpetuate poverty, hunger, and social inequities. Uh, the CIEDS objectives are to eliminate some diseases like mal malaria and chagas, as well as the vertical transmission of chagas, HIV, syphilis, among others, by 2030, and also to achieve the operational goals of the World Health Organization for tuberculosis, leprosy, and HIV. Mm. 
MCTI has a public call under development for research, development, and innovation on prevention, control, diagnosis, and treatment of neglected diseases, which is in line with the CIED's objectives. The thematic lines include development of point of care diagnosis, vaccines, and treatments for the different NTDs. Also, among the international cooperation carried out by the MCTI, we feel it's important to mention the BRICS SCI frame, uh, Framework Program, which aims to support excellence research in priority areas, the Latin American Biotechnology Center, which aims to consolidate cooperation between Brazil, Argenti Argentina, Uruguay, and Colombia, and now the Memorandum of Understanding that's under development with the NDI to promote the open and regular exchange of information and implementing collaborative initiatives that help guarantee the development of safe, effective, accessible, and adapted medicines for diseases affecting neglected patients. Uh, the main the main the main resource for RDNI financing in Brazil is the National Fund for Scientific and Technological Development. And it was determined by law that 30% of the resources from CT Saúde, which is a specific fund of FNDCT aimed to support research, development, and innovation in health, must be dedicated to the research of rare and neglected diseases. So, we understand that to strengthening in to the strengthening of the capabilities and the promotion of sustainable innovation, the MCTI contribution is given by investing in infrastructure creating and managing research networks, sustained, sustained funding for research development and innovation in our areas prioritized by the National Strategy for Science, Technology, and Innovation. And the main challenge we see is to overcome the bottleneck that prevents the academy's discoveries from being transformed into product for the market. So we, in, we believe that the coordination between ICTs, regulatory agencies, and companies is the way to overcome this challenge and accelerate innovation. I thank you very much for your attention, and if you need further information, please get in touch.